Welcome. This is the May 15th meeting of the Yellow Springs Village Council. Uh, we did call to order and do roll call at 6 o'clock. All council members are present, as are the typical um, members of staff. Um, we'll start out with announcements. Brian, I always look to you first. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I do have a few things. Uh, so first of all, if you don't know, uh, May is also Mental Health Month in addition to Biking Month. And uh, NAMI is going to be having their annual meeting. Um, it is going to be May 18th from 7 to 8 in Springfield at the Vernon Center. Um, also, I did want to highlight, I know it's in the packet somewhere, but uh, to confirm that uh, May 30th, we will be having the uh, uh, forum for uh, the community to ask questions of our uh, police chief candidates. That's going to start at 7. And uh, there is going to be child care available at the Bryan Youth Center. And uh, the plan is um, to have that from 7 to 8.30, question and answer. And then we will follow that up with a meet and greet. Um, and that will be here at the Bryan Center. Uh, I guess we will absolutely confirm the room at this meeting. Um, also, pool opens on May 27th. You can get pool passes here at the Bryan Center until the 26th. After that, they're going to be at the pool. And um, I also wanted to uh, emphasize that uh, there's going to be an event this Saturday at the Yellow Springs Brewery. Uh, it's in support of Bike Miami Valley. Um, and it's being hosted by uh, Black Pug uh, Repair. And that's going to start at noon. Okay. Um, anyone else? Um, one thing I wanted to announce is that there is a business after hours this Thursday at 5.30 at Dayton Mailing Service, or DMS Inc. And we actually have legislation regarding them later in the meeting, so it's very timely. So everyone is invited whether you're a chamber member or not. So it's at 888 Dayton Street, and um, their entrance, you would go into the parking lot, their entrance is on the uh, west side of the building. Um, or the west end of the building on the north side. Um, I do have one other. Sure, go ahead. Uh, Community Solutions is having a charrette from 1 to 5 on the 20th. And um, I believe the topic of the charrette involves the land that, uh, that uh, Community Solutions purchased that, uh, that the village is helping for it with the conservation easement. So I know there's been stuff in the newspaper, and there are also things on bulletin boards. But I think it's open to the public. Yeah, I think so too. And is it, do you know where it is? I think it's at this. It's, it's on, on the on property. The, okay. One o'clock on the 20th? Okay. Judith, did you? When? I just had an announcement when you're, are you done? Yeah, I'm done. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody of this, the program Swimming for All which um, is an assistance program for people of modest to low income that their children can have passes to the pool. So um, just to give that out to family and friends who maybe could benefit from that program. Great. And, yeah. Thanks. Hopefully the weather will be like this on May 27th. Um, yeah, a little warmer could be. Uh, so the next thing we have is um, swearing in of uh, three board and commission members. We have um, Cindy Powells from, for the Justice System Task Force, Alan Brunsman uh, for the Energy Board, and Sammy Saber for the Economic Sustainability Commission. So if all three of you would come up, you can kind of recite in unison and enter your own, converse, your own names and commissions when appropriate. So. Can you do this? One, two, three. Yeah. <laughs> I solemnly swear and confirm that I will support the Constitution and will obey the laws of the United States and the state of Ohio, that I will, in all respects, observe the provisions of the Charter and Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs and will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of the <laughs> Whoa. Good job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for Thank serving you. and thanks for. Say what? Can I leave? Yeah, for sure. <laughs>
<laughs> and actually, <laughs> and uh, actually, I wanted to give a shout out to uh, Sammy Saber, um, who I think has the record for finishing the online Sunshine Law training right. before he was even sworn in. Wow. So. Uh, that's a good role model for our other commission members. Thank you. And I'm sorry for mispronouncing your name. Oh, Sam. Um, next is the consent agenda. We have the minutes of April 17th regular meeting, April 24th council retreat, May 1st regular meeting, and the financials for April. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Uh, next is a review of the agenda. Um, there is one item I'd like to add under new business um, to discuss a uh, new business opportunity for the village. So, oh, yeah, I've got a couple of things too. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, I wanted to say again, I'd like to see the staff reports move to, move to after legislation, so while people are still here. And we can do that. I, I talked to Judy about it, and she was uncomfortable changing it on, changing the agenda because yeah. we would have to change our rules, but we can okay. go ahead and just do that at the meeting and okay. decide. And then uh, there's uh, the um, Energy Board had a recommendation uh, that's, that should go under new business. And it was in the packet. Yeah. In the packet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Two recommendations. Thank you. Yeah. And then uh, there's, you might note, there's an MOU uh, from the Justice System Task Force uh, regarding uh, data, uh, data interpretation regarding our uh, police department. Okay. Um, How do you business, please? Thank you. It, um, one of our most recent meetings, Judith had suggested that we um, have a, what she was calling a summit of getting together with the school board and the township. And I don't know, I'm not sure of whether to say that I want to put that into future agenda or have a little time to talk about it. I think given issues of affordability and the fact that the schools are talking about new or remodeled building and we've just passed the levy to the fire station. Not only is it about affordability, but I think it's coordinating major projects. So would, would that go under a discussion um, on a new business or can we put I mean, I there? think, let, I mean, we could take two minutes to make sure we all agreed. I, I don't want to sit here and say, yes, we all agree. But at that point, it's basically a matter of, okay. of a, a okay, Judy spending I'm, some time looking for I dates. Agree. So let's, let's put it under new business and talk, just at least get agreement from all of us. Okay, thank you. Um, and Judith, where did you want this, where did you want to do the staff reports? I thought you had said right after legislation. So okay. Was, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Brian, do you want to review petitions and communications? Yes. Um, so we got several things from uh, Green County Public Health. Uh, first of all, uh, they received a, um, uh, a, an award from Allstate, uh, and they're using that to promote the uh, um, Buckle Up uh, promotion that they do every year. They let us know that uh, Fairborn High School won the uh, seatbelt buckling contest um, with 100%. Uh, what we do know about Yellow Springs is that we did a lot better than we've done in the past. I was going to say, we did get better, on that. <laughs> but we were the worst, I think, at one point. Yeah, we, we were in the 70s, I think, uh, on the first check. So uh, we got to work on those seatbelts. And um, the other thing, uh, they actually did submit something about a resource fair that's, uh, that that's already been passed. Um, I already mentioned about NAMI's annual meeting. Also, the Ohio Department of Health wanted to let everybody know to watch out for the bite because it is mosquito and tick season, and we do have uh, mosquitoes and ticks in our area that can carry uh, disease, uh, although not uh, the Zika, at least as of yet. Um, and then we had three citizen uh, letters. One of them was from Sharon Moeller uh, in support of uh, Dave Meister uh, being selected as chief because he lives in town. Uh, we also had Steve and Molly Diebold who uh, wanted to put in their support for uh, Brian Carlson. And uh, thirdly, uh, Dorothy Bouquet, 
uh, made a comment about um, why uh, we had a agreed not to put something in someone's personnel file um, as a as sort of part of a, a parting of ways. And she highlighted, um, uh, I think his name is Sarpia, is that how you say it? Samuel Sarpia from uh, Illinois, um, who's spoken in the village a couple times and highlighting that they have a system in Rockville where uh, you can anonymously call in and uh, uh, make comments about police officers and suggesting that we might want to have a system like that in Yellow Springs. Okay, thank you. Can, can I make one comment here sure. real quick? It, you know, I, I read about the seat belt challenge and so forth, and you know, it, it's, not, it's not a joking matter. You know, to me, from a community standpoint, when we were at 70% or lower and we raised it a, a little bit, you know, we as adults know that the seat belt, fashion your seat belt saves lives. And, and, and we as adults have to start instilling with our, our youth the importance. And when I say youth, it's not only the, the, those that are up at the high school, the, the youth, I call youth anyone between uh, 18 and 25. And, you know, someone's got to set an example. And uh, the worst thing that we would want to happen is for one of our youth to be injured or lose their life because they didn't take that few seconds to fasten the seatbelt. So, you know, uh, you know I... I know we can't do anything from a council standpoint. It is the law, but to me, as adults, when we see young people without their seatbelts on and we have a chance to say something to them, we should. Thanks for the reminder, Jerry. Yeah. And actually, since Jerry mentioned that about role models, I did forget I wanted to thank uh, Chief Carlson and Sergeant Knapp for being in attendance at Bike to School Day this past Wednesday. Uh, they were putting bike lights that uh, Judy uh, persuaded council to get to promote safety. Um, putting them on all the bikes. We're going to get more and make sure the middle school and high school have them as well. But uh, it was really great to see Brian and Josh interacting with our students and everybody was having a great time. So, Great. And thanks to the folks at Mills Lawn for do and, and the high school and middle school for doing Bike to School Day. They put together a great Bike to School Day. Um, so moving on to public hearings and legislation, we have first reading of Ordinance 2017-11. Um, we'll read it by title only and then I'm sure Krista will ex or, and Patty will explain the gist. Okay, this is approving a, <coughs> a conservation easement for the Tecumseh Land T Trust Preservation Association for a portion of the property known as the Glass Farm. Can I get a motion please? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, Patty, we'll start with you. Okay. As council is aware, we have been working with Tecumseh Land Trust for quite some time to place a permanent con conservation easement on the part of the glass farm that the, is encompassed by the wetland. Um, we finally have what we believe to be the, the correct configuration of that with the appropriate uh, exemptions for um, perhaps if we need to enlarge the culvert, we will be allowed to do that. If we want to make an unimproved or slightly improved in some way trail for bicycles to be go through there, that that will be allowed. Um, and so I, we have changed the northern boundary to be 100 feet wide to allow a two-lane road access, some screening for neighboring homes, and perhaps some parking along that um, the one lane. Uh, Krista, what am I forgetting? Anything? I guess just one of the, the main things I just want to say is I think it's been really helpful to get the extra information, especially from Ken LeBlanc, mm -hmm. to really understand more about, you know, the soils and the lay of the land and um, just to try to make sure that this configuration is really going to going to work for the future and protect the good uh, habitat that has reemerged. Um, I'd encourage anybody that hasn't been out there lately to take a look because mm -hmm. it, it just looks like an entirely different place. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I understand it, the prairie planting is going to probably happen like this week or something. So um, mm -hmm. by 
I'm not sure how much is really going to be visible like by this fall, but by by next summer it should look really great. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks for the work of Tecumseh Land Trust um, on this. Um, do we have Do we have a plot plan? Um, we do, and I'm not sure um, huh. why it's I sent it to you. I thought separately. So I don't have it. I went back over everything with uh, Jessica, and that was that was not in our pile of things. So it's basically, I mean, it's a, can you describe it? It, it, it curves it, it, that was it, 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 yes, it's, there's a hundred feet from the northern boundary going south, and then it comes out, it curves around following uh, the creek, uh, obviously quite a ways off of the creek, but it follows the curve of the creek around, and goes due south, and hits the, um, the southern boundary of the property okay. by Thistle Creek. So uh, this is just the first reading. We will have a second reading. So if you we can make sure we get that um, plan, the plot plan for the second reading. Um, any comments or questions from citizens? Any additional comments or questions from council? Uh, yeah, I have two oh, things. Okay, sorry. Um, so under 2B, 3I, um, I didn't understand um, <coughs> where it said, Geographical jurisdiction of a council. Well, it's on the second page, I guess. Page Under two. purpose. So number oh, two. Is, um, yeah, that, that actually uh, relates to the statute, and it's a natural resources advisory council. So each district in the state. It has one of those advisory councils. Okay. So that's what they're referring to. Okay. It's their province. It's an eight, eight county area. It's the same as for our infrastructure. Okay. Stuff. So do we need to specify more? Or? It's just it's recital. I was going to say this is boilerplate language. I would yeah. assume. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and then the second thing was. So there's a statement about no signage followed up by, so this is, I guess, 5L. What page? Um, it is page followed four. up by what is allowed, too. Though. Right, right, right. But what's different is in the other ones, uh, it says with the exception of what's in 6, blah, blah, blah. And I just wondered if, for clarity, we should put that in 5L as well. Um, what we try to do is put prohibited uses in section five mm -hmm. and then in section six what is allowed so if you wanted to have a phrase at the beginning where it says ex, uh, except as otherwise set forth herein in the introduction of five mm -hmm. we could say in section six right. well and look, look at six b though look at six b it addresses what the grand board could put up by way of signage. No, I understand that, but what's inconsistent is, for example, under G, except it says except is allowed in 6C. So, so we could. It yeah, just seems like consistent. we should be consistent. Okay. I don't think that's a problem. So we'll just add okay. except is allowed in 6B. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, under 5A. Anything else? That's all I saw. Okay. Yeah, I have a question for th number 13, public health and safety provision. I just didn't understand what it was saying. Um, that's if, if there, uh, we've had examples where um, we've had to replace a bridge and widen the right of way slightly. Uh, say someday traffic is very heavy on that road Kingsford. and it becomes a safety problem uh -huh. um, okay. there's justification to widen that right away okay. slightly so that people don't get killed okay mm -hmm. got it thank you great anything else Judy would you please call the roll yes Hempfling yes Housh yes Sims yes McQueen yes Wintrow yes uh, next, we have Resolution 2017-22, uh, read by title only, and then we have uh, Paul Newman from Green County Department of Development to um, explain it. 
All right, this is authorizing the village manager to enter into an addendum to the Ohio Enterprise Zone Agreement by and between the Board of Greene County Commissioners, the Village Council of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and Dayton Mailing Services, Incorporated. Thank Good evening, you. Council Members. Paul Newman, Jr. Oh, hold on. We, can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, I jumped that motion. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. Um, Good evening, Council Members. Uh, Paul Newman, Jr., Director of the Greene County Department of Development, 61 Green Street, Xenia, 45385. Um, the brief that Ms. Bates provided in the packet is perfectly, it just perfectly encapsulates this request for a resolution authorizing an addendum to the original Enterprise Zone Agreement that you entered two years ago with DMS, Inc. Um, there, was been, there has been a delay in the construction as one of the conditions uh, of that agreement, and we're simply requesting a date change, an amendment to date change in that agreement. One year later, for one year later. It, I, I'd add that they have met all other conditions of the Ohio Enterprise Zone Agreement in spades. They have 150% of their goal for new employment They've exceeded their payroll by 255%, and of course they've retained all their employees. So this is a request for a resolution authorizing that amendment to that Ohio Enterprise Zone Agreement. Do they have a projected construction date or start date? I have here um, mid-2017. Okay. <coughs> so soon. They had anticipated the second quarter. When last we spoke, and so Paul, this move, mm -hmm. this shifts everything a year. Um, essentially, uh, Mr. Vice President, what this does is update the date. In fact, if you just pardon, while I take a peek here at the actual changes. Um, part of the original uh, agreement said that no exemption shall commence after January 1, 2019, nor extend beyond December 31, 2029. Um, what that essentially allows is, should there be any other issues with regard to uh, moving forward with the or meeting the conditions of the agreement, we'd have an opportunity as a Turk Council to relook at that, but not have to come back for another uh, resolution. Okay. And it looks like so, we're looking at commencing January 1st, 2017, Completed by December yeah. 31st, 2018. That so, is the current plan. Right. Okay. Any other questions or comments from council? Well, so we've passed January 1st clearly. Yes. So they're still assuming that they can be completed by the end of December. 2018. Yes, that's the assumption at this time. They anticipated a, a midsummer start, and then a duration of three to four months for completion of construction. Oh. So they're still targeting the end of 2017. And it's a relatively simple building. It's a, it's a simple warehouse structure. Um, and just, just again as a reminder that, that they didn't, they're only asking for the tax abatement on new construction. So there is, there's been no abatement given on any of their existing facilities. So um, Council at the time and and the school board and and school superintendent felt like the the growth and the income tax that we were going to be receiving certainly outweighed um, the loss and it's not a hundred percent exemption I think that maybe it's a 75 75, 75. so so the schools will still be getting some some money so um, felt that that what we were going to get in terms of of growth of a business and income tax far outweighed this exemption of, uh, of property tax. Which we're clearly already seeing. Right. Um, right. And then Patty, I saw that you noted here that uh, you did speak to Mario. I did. I spoke directly with Mario and explained it to him and, and he, um, he did say that while he wanted to go to the board, he felt they would have no problems with it. He would get back with me if they did and he has not called me back. So I'm assuming the board has no issues. Great. Okay, if there aren't any other comments or questions, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you, Paul. Thank you, thank you for your time. Uh, we'll move next to staff reports. Um, 
Well, I was going to suggest you maybe you could do that after the special reports. Brian got a call out. Um, oh, okay. Let me give him a moment to get back. Okay. Well, then let's do citizens' concerns first, since that's actually on the agenda. Um, now is the time we'll hear from citizens who um, about items that are not on the agenda. We ask that you come to the podium and um, you have three minutes to um, ask your questions or state your comments. Seeing and hearing none, we'll come back and we will move to special reports. We have um, first the HRC end of the year report. And I see Mr. McQueen is here. <laughs> Hello, how are you today? Good. <laughs> uh, my name is Stephen McQueen. I am actually now the treasurer of, <laughs> of <coughs> HRC, which is Human Relations Commission. I'm just moving from secretary. Um, I do want to remind you that um, our mission is to promote harmony among the citizens of the village and to work to eliminate prejudice and discrimination within the village against any individual or group because of race, religion, nationality, heritage, gender, age, disability, <laughs> sexual orientation, or economic class. Um, last year we were able to work with 8,500. We are very confident that we could work with that amount again. Um, we submitted a report that um, I must admit there's a few things I forgot to put on there, but we have 11 projects where we actually worked on about 13 to 14. Um, I forgot to mention uh, how we supported Kwanzaa and also how we uh, supported the um, YSKP as well. And uh, however, I, if there are any questions about the different uh, things that we did support, I hope you did get the report. No. Was I didn't there no get report, report submitted? No, I sent it back to you because it was track changes and I couldn't change it. I couldn't change it. It was a draft. I sent you that back on Thursday. Oh, that wasn't supposed to be a draft at all. That was... No, oh, yeah, it was a draft. Completely. Did it say draft on it for some reason? No, it didn't. But sometimes when you send a document and you, you say, I accept the changes, it re it's received with all the changes still tracked. And so I couldn't... I couldn't manipulate it at all. It had red marks and crossouts and all kinds of stuff. So I sent it back to you, but you must not have gotten that. Oh, I'm wondering if I somehow sent the original and not the one that I updated. Because I know what you're talking about, but yeah. that's what was sent to me. I should have sent you what I worked on, which would have been the full report to send to you for. Yeah, I apologize. Uh, well, I should have followed up with you again because I didn't hear back. That That's my oh, failure okay. to follow no, up. okay. No, the only thing sorry. is I just said that I didn't have pictures. Or I do have pictures, but I didn't send them that day because I was, I've been very busy. I am before, like, it's been pretty crazy for me recently. But um, Why? So I assume why? that you did. <laughs> yes, well, because of a wedding that's coming up. Whose <laughs> <laughs> wedding? Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, also took... Um, in which, yeah, even under the weather today, so the fact that I'm here, um, yeah, I really, everything I have written here was to explain everything that you were supposed to have. So, so I mean, do you want to, do you want to come back to another meeting or, I mean, I hate to ask Not you to do month, that. No, no. yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, and like, that's true. It went, yeah. Your next meeting would still be this, well, no, this, June. This is it for the month. Yeah. I could come back for that meeting only because I really thought that we'd be hammering it out now, so which I would. So I don't mind doing that. So June fifth, are you to, sure? That's okay. yes. I'm quite so sure that I will come back good. and make sure that we have everything squared away. Make sure there's no drafts, photos included. It'll that's be that's great. Whole, Perfect. So, and yeah. Steve, when you come back, could you also bring a request for a budget for the HRC? Yes, well, like I said, we want to re remain with what we were given last year, it's but and so that's, but we also wanted to show you what we've done with last year's budget. So, next year, I'll or sorry, next month, I'll make sure we have all of that squared away. Sounds great. Absolutely. Thank yeah, you. I apologize. No, we had that in there. That's okay. Judy, I apologize. I'll make sure we get there. And I'll, I'll follow up with you tomorrow. Okay. You've probably got it ready to go now, so we'll just yeah, lock exactly. it in quick. Okay. And good luck with your plans. Yes. And thank you. Um, <laughs> next, we have the environmental. Wow. Well, happy we wedding, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> we have sort of the op. The opposite issue with the Environmental Commission. We do have the report, 
but we don't have the person who's supposed to be giving the report. Mm. So Tom uh, Dietrich had written up this report, um, and Dewart Headley was supposed to come and give the report. Well, neither of them are here, and um, I've texted them both, and I haven't heard from them. So what is your pleasure? I mean, I can, I can talk okay. about it. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, can I just interrupt for one minute? I need to make uh, an emergency announcement just real quick. Um, if you're trying to call the police department, um, we have some problems with our phones right now. It is a Cincinnati Bell problem. The 911 number does work. Even if you can't get through on the other line and it's a non-emergency, please call the 911 number and someone will help you. Thanks. Okay, um, so the Environmental Commission has had, uh, has been working on several projects. The projects are listed in this report. And um, one of the projects is the Source Water Protection Plan. Uh, Jessica D'Ambrosio had been our lead person on that, and Jessica, who had been working at the college, left several, oh, probably about a half a year ago, mm -hmm. to work at the Nature Conservancy. She still managed to come a couple times and do some work, but uh, didn't really, I mean, she doesn't, she lives in northwestern Ohio now. So this, this has been on hold, uh, getting the plan finished, and what we plan on doing for 2017. The plan essentially is finished except for the education piece. So that's what we'll be working on in 2017. The Glass Farm Conservation Area, uh, as you know, we've had reports ongoingly this year. We have uh, worked on renaturalizing the wetlands, and uh, as we heard today, we got the conservation easement first uh, first approval, first round of approval. The honeysuckle, which uh, the um, what is that tree that Bradford pear. The Bradford pear, which had totally consumed the acreage south of the wetlands, had been removed once by grinding them up, basically, once by spraying them, and I think they were sprayed again today to, to, get, them, to get the invasive species out. That's where the prairie is going to be. The, the wetlands themselves are doing great, there, there does seem to be runoff from, I suppose, nitrogen that causes a lot of that green muck stuff. We don't know whether the beavers are still there or not, um, but the wetlands are still there. And work is still being done on, uh, on the grant that we have with the Tecumseh Land Trust. The pesticide reduction, Nadia Malarkey had uh, brought some people here to work with some groups in town, including the village. She's bringing, she's going to have another workshop sometime this year. The village itself is, used some alternatives last year on some of the village on sites. There's an experiment going on now on the uh, park, see how that works. Um, the waste stream, waste stream reduction is not really something we did much of. The Environmental Commission did much uh, the past year. The coordinating with the Yellow Springs Resilience Network, there were six areas of focus that were, there were programs last year on the six areas mentioned in this report, and some of the people from the Environmental Commission worked on each of these programs. The, that was transportation, food, local economy, buildings, waste, and energy. And the last thing, the Climate Action Plan, is something in progress. The Climate Action Plan is something that would involve village government and uh, businesses and residents in uh, various ways of reducing our carbon footprint. And this will be an ongoing process. Uh, I think Council got, got a got a draft. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether that's something that can be shown on, I guess, shown in the um, It can't, because you just asked for one copy for yourself. I, I did not oh, know that to Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, well, I didn't know I was going to be giving the report either. Mm -hmm. So, sorry. Um, does anyone have any questions? No, good work. Yeah, excellent. That looks great. Thanks. We do have one new member, um, De no, two new members, Deanna and, um, Bettina. Newsom and Bettina Stoltenberg. Great. And we have one. George Coder uh, is uh, on the Environmental Commission he, as an alternate. Thank you, George. <laughs> So it looks like we have all of our staff in place, so we will do staff reports. We'll start with our manager. Okay, um, permanent chief search update. We had three applicants for the chief of police position, Brian Carlson, Dave Meister, and Tim Spradlin. Council will be conducting uh, interviews tomorrow evening in executive session with all three of those candidates. I believe later we're going to talk about the public forum and the meet and greet, which are scheduled for May 30th, uh, currently at 7 p.m., but that may change during the discussion tonight. Uh, any resident who cannot attend the public forum but would like to submit a question to be answered by the candidates can send that question to me at my village email which is noted in my report, or you can get it from the village website. Um, additionally, we are working on comment cards uh, that will be available for the public to also submit comments on uh, the candidates. Water quality update. Um, we had to revise the water quality report. There were two results uh, for barium and fluoride that um, we didn't realize that we had to report because it's a new reporting requirement. Uh, so we did not report them, and they were both below the limits. We need to uh, update our report, um, and the updated report can be found online for anyone who wants to look at that. The water plant is still um, moving uh, along the building of the new one. However, our current water plant had a sand filter under drain system problem. So we do currently have one filter offline. Um, we can operate perfectly fine on two filters. Uh, we are going to be able um, to nurse that along until we get our new plant built uh, in November of this year and get it online. So we just wanted folks to be aware of that. We know we had a few brown water issues and that was primarily due to um, the problem with that filter. Um, in the packets, council will find the two briefs on that were previously requested, one on no smoking, smoking in public places, as well as one on Tree City. Um, as Brian mentioned, the Gaunt Park Pool opens May 27th. Passes are available at the Brian News Center during hours of operation, which are normally 3 to 9 p.m. through May 26th. Once the pool opens, they will be sold only at the pool. So after that uh, May date, please do not come to the Brian Center for a pool pass. Um, you also see in there a very detailed work log from Denise Swinger. Um, this, is, this gives you an idea of how incredibly busy the planning and zoning office is right now. And um, this is just, you know, a couple of weeks worth of Denise's log that um, she kind of tracks to see what she's doing. Um, she will be giving council regular updates in the packets as far as a brief on what um, planning commission is going to be talking about. Okay. But this gives you a really good detailed idea of what she goes through in a couple of weeks. Great. So yeah, just let her know that we don't need to see that much detail. Yeah, she all yeah, the time. She yeah, I, I think she misunderstood a little yeah. bit when I talked to her the first time. It was great though. I mean, it's, yeah. and sometimes it's good for yourself to be able to kind of log and right. and have that as a record. So, thanks, Patty and Melissa. Okay, um, with the weather changing, we have had um, people start to come in asking about um, summer sewer credits, which is, you all may remember, um, what we do is we take a look at um, it, the people that sign up and want to be a part of the program. We take a look at their usage in the summer and we compare it to their usage in the winter and then any difference we give them as a credit on their sewer with the assumption that the water is being used for summer uh, garden and water or garden yard and watering. And what we've kind of um, we've kind of bumped into a few things that require us to uh, to make a few changes in the ordinance. Um, the first thing would be how the uh, credits are calculated. Currently the ordinance states that um, or refers to our quarterly billing process and we're now billing monthly so that change needs to be updated. 
in the ordinance. Um, the second is I would like to put a maximum credit given in the ordinance. Um, last year we seen quite a few extremely large credits given, um, which we were assuming um, based on information we had were attributed to leaks, pool fills, and other non-permitted uses. I would like to suggest that uh, a cap of 6,000 gallons over the course of the three summer months would be a reasonable amount based on um, some of the usage and the other credits that we'd been given people um, over the last few years that this has been enacted. And that would minimize any potential um, misuse of the ordinance. Um, and lastly, I would like to also add a provision about apartment complexes and multi-unit dwellings. Um, which would require the owner to apply for the summer yard and gardening credit versus individual tenants um, for any outdoor areas. We've had some individual tenants apply in apartment complexes and we'd like to limit that for, to one credit per unit. Um, so if council would be agreeable to uh, some or all of those changes, I could bring those to the next meeting. Could, uh, Melissa, when you say one credit per unit, you mean like for one apartment building they get one because typically an apartment building wouldn't have numerous outdoor areas in which all the tenants would be applying and we've kind of seen that happening um, so we the the current ordinance doesn't have any of these provisions so basically anybody that signs up we look at their summer compare it to their winter we give them a credit um, so we do know that there are a number of apartment complexes and units that do have outdoor areas and if one person is responsible for them then we could grant that person whoever that water is connected to that that credit for that water. Well, I mean isn't it typically an outdoor spigot? I mean I'm curious as to how that is taken care of by if, if you have an apartment where the landlord where, where each tenant is responsible for the water and sewer bill who is paying that outdoor spigot? It would, it would depend on the unit. What The reason why I even added that provision is because we've had several people in apartments that sign up in the same unit for credit and there aren't any outdoor areas in those spaces that we're aware of. So we were trying to get ahead of that one, okay. actually. I mean, I think it makes sense. It's probably going to, it may require a little bit of checking and mm -hmm. it may be different for different properties yes um, depending upon how the setup utility setup is I think they all seem reasonable and I don't, any other comments or questions okay go ahead sounds like is council okay with her bringing that forward okay. yeah Okay, um, and then the other the other items, uh, the utility billing software conversion is coming along. Um, they the staff will start to be trained the first three days beginning in June. So I'm hoping that that conversion is going to happen shortly thereafter. Um, and then the new finance software through the uh, auditor of state, which I've been trying to get uh, done for I don't know over a year now. Um, I'm registered for training at the end of June. They only offered it twice a year, and both times were not possible for me. So. That's it for me. Great, thank you. Melissa, I have a question. So I've been delaying doing anything about the utility roundup thing until the software, when you're comfortable with that. When do you think would be a good time month to start talking about that again? Well, I'm hoping that this should be up and running. Um, they'll get trained. We'll do a month of a parallel process where we bill under the new system and the old system to, to make sure it works properly before we convert over to the new system to work out any bugs. So it's my hope that that should only take two months. But if we find issues or bugs, that could delay it a little bit. So but, I would want the staff to be able to run the new system for a few months before we would change anything else since it's, an, it's a new system. Shall I talk to you at the beginning of fall? I think that would be great. Okay. Thank you. Um, Chief Carlson. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Mm -hmm. The police department had its first implicit bias training on May 11th with Mr. Keen Tony. Uh, it was great. Pat Deweese and uh, Dave Turner came and sat in on the lecture. And I'd like to keep everyone informed for some of our future training where we welcome the public and if people want to pop in and, and, and see what we're doing, we'd love that. 
Um, the implicit bias training was great. It was informative, interesting presentation. It focused on how to keep ourselves aware of the implicit bias we all carry in our subconscious. Mr. Tony also spoke of how each individual encounter we have as officers is either a deposit or withdrawal into the bank of respect from our community. I like this comparison. I think I've said numerous times we're going to change things one encounter at a time. And uh, I really like the way that, that he uh, related that to us. The department has our second session with Mr. Bill Parsons. That's scheduled for June 2nd as we continue our de-escalation and effective community policing segment of the training. I'm happy to answer any questions. I also, before tonight, I've made some copies for you guys of the six uh, principles of nonviolence, the Kingian philosophy, and I think these are pretty cool. So we're hoping to incorporate some of these uh, in our policy as well down the road. Any questions? Oh, or? I remember you said there's something coming up that, that some of us could uh, do some role playing or something. Yeah, our <laughs> third session with Bill Parsons, um, we're going to do a two hour segment where we invite some of the public to share some of their stories with law enforcement. Um, we'll talk about it and we'll choose maybe four or five uh, of these scenarios, if you will, and then we're going to role play. So the public can be the officer, I get to be you. Um, he also has some actors that he'll bring along, and it's, it's pretty cool because you get to kind of see from different person's perspective. And Great. we'll let you know when that is. I'm not, that's okay. not scheduled yet, but that'll be our third. Okay, cool. Great. Thank cool. you. Thanks, Chief. Thanks. Judy? Oh, it's been busy. Lots of minutes and packets and things. Um, just to add to something that Brian Hausch mentioned about the child care at the youth center, they're, they're ramped up and ready. They have crafts, they have movies, they're going to have snacks. So don't just think of it as, oh dear, should I? It'll be a great time for your kid, and you can come up and really fully participate without anything or one hanging off of your sleeves. So I, I highly recommend it. Great. And they'll be there, in, even in fact, I should mention, normally they'll take children six and over for those, and they're bringing an extra person in to take children younger than six. They can only take about four kids that young, so just let them know if that's a need that you have. Great, thank you. Um, so now we're moving on to old business. The first item of business is the Chief of Police Selection Process Update. I think we've gotten um, the information on the candidates, and so we know that the first, um, what we're doing, council is meeting tomorrow at 5 to interview those three candidates. Um, I think what we really are kind of wanting to talk about is just to, to, to confirm the two meetings, I mean, the, the May 30th, and to talk about um, a location, um, which is why I asked Judy to um, develop this sheet about um, the venues, the three venues here in the Bryan Center and what the pros and cons are of each so we can help um, decide where we should have those interviews and also just reaffirm um, how we want that set up to go or how we want that process to, to unfold. Um, I mean, unless there's anything do we want to talk about for tomorrow night, is there? No. Okay. Go ahead, Jill. Well, um, are we are we just are we just going to I guess I do want to ask a question about tomorrow um, we just bring our own we bring questions mm -hmm. council and the staff are going to be there and mm -hmm. we'll just okay and we'll be here in here mm -hmm. okay yes. and will we have a table set up yes different okay oh. yeah it's similar to I'll when we care. did the other interviews Judy I think you did that set up um, in terms of the 30th, um, so the forum, the public forum with the candidates, you know, the more I think about, we had talked about rooms A and B with a capacity of 70. But not really if you look at the, how many you lose with the table set up. Yeah, a 55. I'm just concerned about that. I, I feel like is, I know it's a little more of, it's more of an effort to go to the gym. It's not going to be full probably. Um, but I just feel like we're likely to have more citizens who want to participate than 50 some citizens or potentially we do and I would hate to be having people out in the hallway. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is I know uh, Patty you're gathering cards and that kind of thing but I think um, 
I mean, I think it's good that for people who aren't able to come to be able to send in their questions or whatever. But um, I don't see a problem with citizens coming up and asking a question. And it seemed to me like it, then all the candidates should be able to answer. And we were going to have the, um, weren't we going to have uh, mediators there that would mm -hmm. sort of, and then every second or third question, it could be one of the questions that people have submitted who aren't there or something like that. Does that <laughs> make sense? All right. Something like that, but I, but I would think um, I know sometimes uh, questioners will ask one particular candidate, but I th I'm kind of feeling like we should give everybody an opportunity to answer each of the questions, so there's no. Uh, oh, I thought well, what they can do is start with one person one time, and then a different person. You know, let all three right. of them answer, but rotate who you start with. Oh yeah, that's a great idea. Yep, mm -hmm. good idea. So Judy, will you be, or Patty, both of you, one or both of you, be coordinating this process with the mediators? Uh, yeah, I'm okay. emailing with John. I okay. just, um, we're waiting for council to decide where you're going to have it and whether we want to start at six or seven. Okay. I guess I really, um, I'm, I'm personally not thinking we're going to have um, that many people. I, I mean, I think because we're talking about people that the community knows, uh, know, um, it just, the gym is just such a, such a cavernous space. It's just such an impersonal space. I don't, I don't think it'll be a comfortable place in which to do interviews like this. Um, although I do know, I do recall when we, the first time we interviewed village managers, when we were first on council, we actually did have their they presented or or spoke and took questions in the gym. I did. Um, did you? You were in the gym? Yeah. Okay. So I guess we'll... I mean, I think if we um, have people move towards the front, you know, if we don't have a million chairs down there, if we can add on, if there's more people, to try to keep people in a little more, you know, so people aren't just scattered around the whole room, even... No, that would be my well, thought. Well, um, with I, the mediators I, to I, help do that. I'm <clears throat> I understand there's a little problem with sound equipment for using the gym at this at this time. And and what I think I have I'm sorry, go ahead, Bartley. Bartley. All my stuff to use for the summer events that I use it for. So it's actually not currently here right now, but depending on what time time frame you you need this for, then I can probably bring it back. It's for the thirtieth, right? Mm -hmm. May. Mm -hmm. I, I actually have one other, I won't say concern, but thought about the gym is that um, when I did my question and answer down there, um, I was the only person in there, so I was at the podium. But if you're going to have three people, um, they can't all be at the podium, and it's going to extend it quite a bit with people walking back and forth. So they would be sitting actually on the same level as the community, and I don't know if that would interfere or not with people being able to understand the you know same level questions. And I mean, it, it seemed like we did okay with the. I mean, were there only be three people there, so we'll have enough microphones. I mean, I think we'll have enough. Part of the issue when council was down there is that we didn't have enough microphones. Mm -hmm. And the one other thing I was going to ask is if we wanted to each candidate to do a self-introduction and speak for a few minutes before we started the questions. Yes. So at that point they could, maybe we could have the, the podium at the side and um, so they would go up to the podium and then have a table where they would all three be sitting at a table and then go back to the table and answer questions from the table. Now that I guess is going to make the whole sound situation a little bit more complicated. Um, because we're because we're back again to needing all of those to needing three microphones. Um, can we just do a handheld? Passive. Well, that's what we had when when you did it. We had handhelds. Well, I was at the podium. Well, we have one set up at the podium, but we also had the handhelds. So. Well, and just to throw into the mix, an option in terms of if if there's a concern about the number of people, is that. Uh, Bartley would be able to set up a monitor in in and B for anyone who didn't for an, an overflow, and we have again mediators so that there could be something worked where 
mediators are coming back and forth with questions or bringing people in if they need to ask questions. I mean, that, that's workable if you, if you feel like, you know, there may not be enough folks to justify the gym setup, but too many for this room. I actually think I like that better than the gym. I, I mean, I, I definitely don't like the gym, but I'm one person. Well, we did, we did use rooms A and B the last time, but I don't know. Again, my feeling about A and B is the, the, the capacity between this chambers and A and B is virtually the same. And here we have all of our audio video, we have everything ready, we have mics, we have everything that they need, and it's very easy to broadcast live we would have to spend money and time to upfit A and B to do the same thing. I mean, I do want to say that rooms A and B is set up to just plug in and, and film live. And I'm not sure why that knowledge has been forgotten, but um, that doesn't mean that we can't do it in chambers, but it should not be that complicated to do it in rooms A and B. Is that true that it's? It is. So it's the microphone, it's the miking. But well, we could we could do it certainly from here and then have the monitor and be that might be the simplest. Could we maybe we should hear from people it, here? Yes, I, I, that was just what I was thinking. If people in the audience have a sense of or our citizens, how many people would be coming? And just a comfort level, knowing the spaces, what, what sounds reasonable. When you're, when you're hearing somebody speak about something, it's a lot less, I don't know, you don't get a good sense when you're watching on a lot of personal things. I, I like to see the person's face and interact with them. But there would, be, there would be over 50 people. There would be sure. 55 to 60 but, people, but people sitting in here. It would have to stay in the, in the other room. Mm -hmm. Does anyone, do any of our other citizens have a sense of how many people might be coming? Well, I certainly agree with Dan, but I have no idea what the expected turnout is going to be. It's on it's off my radar. Maybe we could have a call in or something. something. <laughs> is there anybody to gauge interest? Yeah, that's what I was wondering. On the village Facebook page or something? I, 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 don't, I just don't think that would be well, adequate. I mean, we could do it, but I'm not sure how many responses you would get in a timely enough manner to, mm -hmm. uh, to decide. Because council doesn't meet again before the, I mean, we interview tomorrow night, but other than that, we don't meet again. <laughs> what happened the last time? Uh, we did it in rooms A and B, and uh, yeah, we did it in here. <coughs> we no, we, the citizen part. The we did the meet and greet. It was in rooms A and B. It was in A and B. It was it. Yeah. How um, many people showed up? Forty. Forty or fifty. Yeah. And that was those were all unknown candidates. But that was before things changed. True. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and. We could choose to to not uh, not show it live. I mean, that would probably make it a little bit. Would that? I guess that wouldn't make it any. I mean, I think we have to have a tape available. Although um, we're talking about making a decision within five days of this of these interviews, Patty making a decision within five days. So um, if it doesn't run live citizens are really not going to have much of an opportunity to see it if they aren't if they aren't here at the meeting can i just uh, this is going to sound a little snarky but there have been times where council has prepared and prepared and prepared and prepared for pretty critical reports pretty critical input from citizens and we've had between one and four people show up you know, other times that um, the gym's been prepared, expecting a large group, and it's been certainly a group that could have fit in into this room. Each meeting subsequent to the initial meeting following the New Year's Eve incident has been smaller and smaller and smaller. 
I, I would think perhaps it is acceptable for council to make the decision as to where the candidates and and those who are present are most comfortable with the people that they're interacting with, have the most up, up close and personal kind of contact possible, make arrangements if there happens to be an overflow, but not cater to the possibility that maybe a huge number of folks will show up because that has happened in the past and it's just not, it's not transpired. And if we use A and B, there really isn't an easy way to do the meet and greet. I guess we could do the meet and greet in the hallway or in this lobby, but we can't have that set up and have the room set up for the meeting. All the chairs are going to have to come out. So it, that doing, having A and B serve double duty becomes difficult. Uh, you set A and B up partially for just overflow and, and planning on doing why don't we just vote on it I mean we've talked about it for a while now I don't yeah. know that we're going to get to any uh, further uh, Dan's idea. well yeah I mean that's Dan's idea is essentially I think the idea that we're right. that Judy and I have talked about so the, the, the issue, the idea would be that we would have the actual interviews and, and conversation here. The candidates would be here. I think we would go ahead and, ha ahead and have the candidates sit here so they're easily seen. They've got the microphones. They can easily be heard. Um, and, and then um, we'll have 50 to 55 people here. We can get rid of that table so we can, get, we can have more, um, more chairs in here. And then we put overflow in A and B, and we also um, do the meet and greet in A and B, and we facilitate with mediators, say, a back and forth if people want to come in here to ask questions or um, bring questions in. Um, so that is the motion that I'll put forth for, um, for voting. You want a second? Any discussion? I was going to say, rather than them being up here, because we're all going to take almost 10 seats otherwise, if we're sitting down there, mm -hmm. I would suggest we have a podium at one end and we stay up here. And the but then candidate. we've got the issue of microphones. Then we've got the issue of if they aren't using these microphones, they're not going to be mic'd and they're not going to be heard. Well, it's just uh, we're going to be taking a fair number of the seats. Well, I, I could also suggest council doesn't have to be in this room. You can go to the monitors if, in fact, citizens want to come in because it's a citizen input time and you're there to watch but you really can't participate so you don't have to be in this room if, if a monitor will work right it's not a council meeting per se and we could you know we could even take our cue from how many people are here you know dan why don't you come up <laughs> sorry we're making you do that but <laughs> you just speak softly <laughs> oh. Oh, hi um Dan Reyes, and just listening to this, you, you may have discussed some of it already, but uh, I'm thinking about the open question, I think Karen or, or you all collectively were asking is trying to anticipate uh, what the public might want or wish to do. And uh, it, it also might be what the council and uh, what, uh, Patty, uh, you want from the public, which will drive how many people will come. And essentially, as I understand the process, uh, it's Patty is going to do the hire, council is going to do an advisory or a recommendation, and then there's a question of what the village's role uh, as citizens might be. I'm not advocating for any particular one, but for instance, if council or Patty wish to have no, citizens score candidates, you might get an enthusiastic response from some part of the village. I don't know if that's a good idea or not. Or if you just wanted to have it open as an audience opportunity, it might be harder to gauge. It might be a small crowd. Does that make sense as I, I mean, the, the sort of role of the citizens may very well drive whether you have a gymnasium full, willing or interested in coming, or whether you have sort of the, the you know, rather ordinary crowd that we get for uh, any of the other important business that the village might have to deal with. Well, I mean, obviously, it's very important to get citizen input mm -hmm. in, in some form. I mean, in, 
I think that's part of what we're discussing is, is exactly what shape that form would take. Um, my thought was that the, the citizens could come listen to all of the candidates answer all of the questions, um, think about those answers, ask anything they wanted, um, and then provide me and the council with um, a response that said, out of the candidates present, I preferred this candidate become chief, and here are some comments as to why that should happen, some comments about why I chose them over other candidates, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. not, a, not a numerical scoring, per se. Yeah, yeah that, that might not be a good idea that I just put out there, but I, yeah. I kind of put it out there for a contrast range. Yeah. For, but I do think it's a good question, and one we haven't addressed, I don't know. I mean, I think it might, it, it may or may not fit into the location scenario, but. Yeah. And, and Patty, your, your point, I think, too, that there are multiple possible factors for council and yourself to take into consideration. Right. Some of them will be apparent from the meeting and some won't. So I don't right. mean to no. inflate that meeting's purpose by just raising that question. But that might, the, a sense of what the purpose for the yeah, audience it's a good meeting point. would be would help people decide how committed they were. How important it was for them to come. Yeah. I'm not for us not being in the room. Personally, I feel like we should be in the room if we're if we're actually and I also don't think we should be asking citizens necessarily to vote on who they're for, but to make comments, you know, just uh, input whatever they've noticed that, you know, and that those I guess we're having them write this on cards that will be passed in or something like that. Um, but if if it's true that watching a monitor, you don't really catch the whole of what's going on, then the then the village manager and the council who's advising her, if, if we're not in the room, so we're not really getting the full picture of what happened, then there's, you know, that makes it less important that citizens come, I think, and I don't think there's a purpose to doing it that way. Yeah, no, I, I, I think it makes sense for us to be in the room. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm, leaning, I'm leaning toward doing it in the gym. I mean, it may be that not many people come, but given how critical this whole issue has been, um, I think it would be a lot easier to do it in the gym. I think it would be a lot easier for people to to submit questions um, and certainly to set up A and B. I mean, it's going to be more expensive, uh, more work, but at, at least it would show we're being serious about it. So that's what I think. I mean, uh, if we're going to do it in here, I think we should stay up here just because there's all these chairs up here and we can sit up here and then not be taking a bunch of chairs down there and set it up in some way, you know, so we're kind of out of the way up here and then the, the people who are speaking, I don't know where they go, I don't know how you set up the room, but I, I just, that, uh, that's my only thought, if we're going to do it in this room that we use up all this space and we could maybe have, I don't know, maybe some other people could sit or stand back here if there are a lot of people here. Mm -hmm. And so that we don't use all yes. this space for the three candidates. I'm Pat Seymour. Can you, um, Pat, can you go up? You speak softly. Can you go up to the microphone? I'm Pat Seymour, and I, um, this is an interesting discussion, but I really don't think it should be in the gym. The gym is just a horrible place to hear. I mean, you, it is for me, and I think it would be for many, many people. The, the sound is so poor. This is a beautiful place. And um, I also don't think that it's much of an impediment to not be in the actual room. For, you know, if any overflow <coughs> comes into A and B, um, I don't think that's a, a bad thing. That's all. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. <clears throat> maybe we could ask the overflow, maybe we could ask at some point it, that um, people, some people who had been in here go out and let the overflow in if they're overflow, if mm -hmm. we're going to do it in here. So that everybody could have some time in this in this space where it's actually happening. Okay. So are we ready to vote? Well, what time are we starting? Seven. So we're starting at seven. Yeah, yeah I so think we'll it should start be seven. At seven and should we say something like, Starting at seven, and then the meet and greet will go, will begin at eight, or immediately following the forum. I think we should mm -hmm. allow until eight thirty. Oh, so I was going to yeah. say eight thirty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I, the idea of 
maybe setting up half the room with chairs, half of A and B with chairs, mm -hmm. and half with the table and the food and punch and whatever. Gotcha. So I, I guess I feel okay about us doing it in here if, if like I say, if we're not taking a path, to, if we try to set it up that way, and then if we can try to ask citizens to take a turn here and then go back there kind of thing. So that, that feels okay, okay to me. And, and I guess, so let's just, the, the, the motion was about the space, so let's just take the, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Um, I think Patty and maybe, and Melissa have been working on a, a, a comment card, a question card. Mm -hmm. Is that something we want or do we simply want to give blank cards and have people write whatever they want? Well, should we talk about what's on the card? What would? Well, the one thing that's on the card is um, here are the candidates' names and please circle the one that you would like to see be the chief. And um, I know, Judith, you feel like that's voting, but um, to me that's the best way to, to understand what the majority of the citizens would want in particular. It's followed by questions as to tell me why you chose this candidate um, tell me why you did not choose um, one of the other candidates, you know, what particular issues were, were that made up your mind. Um, i trying to think of what else was on there. Do you remember? Did it have characteristics that they were, I know that that was bad ground, but I don't know where um, that might have fallen. I don't, I don't think we put that on there. Brian, do you remember if there was another question? Um, I, I mean, I think the only other question is just other comments. Mm -hmm. So I think that's enough. Um, I like. I think that sounds fun. I don't like the uh, idea of of having people more or less vote for who they think's best. Um, I think it's better to ask more general. You know, have the names of the candidates because people so people know, you know, can see their names and ask them to just comment on impressions of the different candidates, things they would like us to know that they're thinking about relative to those candidates. You know, ultimately, these three people have to work back together, and I just, I just, I don't know. I, there's something about that that I don't. I think it's. Uh, I think it'd be better to not ask people to circle the one they're for or something like that, because people can, you know, bring their friends, and I don't know. I just foresee it. It sort of goes down a road that doesn't feel that comfortable to me. Of course, we all get up elected, so I don't know. But but this is not an elected position, right? So. So just general questions, I mean, maybe whether you list them, <coughs> list each candidate and then leave space. Yeah, just, that would be another way I to mean, do that it. Might, yeah, rather that than might be the easiest way to yeah. do it. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then you can make a comment. You know, maybe, st you know, the heading is we want it, We want your input. We want to hear your input on your, yeah. your impressions and yeah. reactions to these candidates. And I mean, people could share. say very short phrase on each one. It doesn't have to be a long written paragraph mm -hmm. or something. Uh, I think people from Yellow Springs will do what they want to do. <laughs> true, very true. Good point. But I'm just saying it doesn't require, that doesn't require a big lengthy thing yeah. necessarily. People can keep it short. Yeah, I think we can keep it simple. Okay. Sounds good. Are we ready to move on to the next discussion? Um, Judith, this is... Um, Village Justice. Oh. Just a system task force. Mm -hmm. We just kind of wanted to, I think when we, at the last meeting, because there were two issues that were presented and, you know, there was some frustration being expressed by the Justice System Task Force about, you know, whether things were going to be approved or what was going to happen with all the work. So I think that um, this was just a way to, for council to have some input in how all of this work from Justice System Task Force is going to get integrated um, into um, everyday business in the police department. So, yeah, so I was going to say, uh, Mary Ann wrote up uh, some ideas that I think are very good, and uh, so I'm going to hand yeah. it. Yeah. So we have a what we call a leadership team on the Justice Task Force, which are Pat Deweese, Ellis Jacobs, Judith, and myself. And uh, Pat had written some thoughts. I wrote up some of my thoughts, and we met today. Uh, today. So um, I'll tell you my thoughts about the council part of it. Uh, one is that one recommendation would come from the task force to council at a time, mm -hmm. no more than one. And that uh, council, uh, 
agenda planning would make sure that that recommendation had adequate time to be discussed by council early enough so that we weren't brain dead and so, and so that the public is can be listening to and that one council person and one justice system task force person be responsible for shepherding the recommendation through whatever steps it needs to go through that there be a living document managed by one person that includes the various recommendations as they come through to council it would also say what the next steps need to be on that recommendation have a timeline and be updated as those next steps are happening I had suggested that maybe Judy be that person and we had a brief conversation uh, well, uh, email discussion about that um, and that at some point when the task force has completed its recommendations that there be um, a list of all the recommendations and perhaps even a, a valuation reevaluation of them as Karen you said there may be things that change during the time period or one recommendation impacts another recommendation and you don't know it until after they're all on board so that it, that, that sort of the last time council would really look at all the recommendations and institutionalize them at that point really um, that, oh, so those are my thoughts and I can well we can talk about it and I'm happy to write it down for another council no, I think meeting. that sounds good and I was going to say that doesn't mean that nothing happens between here and the you know when the, the whole report comes together so I don't know you didn't really say that but no. just to say um, you know when it's inst before it's institutionalized you know things are happening the CIT training is happening uh, right. in fact you know some of that we may we may have we may decide to do um, uh, you know legislation on some of it if it makes sense I, I think that could happen if it's pretty clear-cut and there's nothing complicated about it so we're not making all these decisions at the at the end uh, but then but that we'd have that review at the end so you know changes are occurring along the way and those steps are you know being followed but uh, in the end we'll look it over anyway I just want to make that clear okay I mean I think that all sounds sound? reasonable any other comments from anyone do any of you on the task force? I mean, is it just you, John? <laughs> you don't have anything to say. Okay. I, Judy, did it, I thought you said you would be comfortable with that? Is that right? Yes. And and one thing that Pat was saying is uh, she the six pillars of justice. I think it's called, mm -hmm. uh, which you know came out of the Obama uh, task force on policing. Um, uh, we're going to use that and we're going to put a seventh pillar which has to do with mayor's court because the six pillars were really about policing that piece of the justice system um, we're going to use that kind of as our guidepost to uh, you know kind of uh, as we're moving our work along so uh, just to say that we're going to be using that as a tool great okay do we want to go ahead and, and discuss the justice system, the MOU, while we're talking yeah, about the justice system task force? Yep. Okay. John, did you want to? I think John was here to talk on this. Come out. This came from uh, a committee that includes John, Pat, Deweese, and who else? Um. So uh, it also includes Bill Randolph and um, Kit Hamilton, although she wasn't there at the meeting in which we discussed this. Um, so the Justice System Task Force is requesting, and feel free to interrupt me if I'm going into too much detail here, it's requesting $224 to pay Mike Bottomley, a statistical programmer and analyst at Wright State University's Statistical Consulting Center, to look at the race and age of suspects who were issued misdemeanor and minor misdemeanor citations by the Yellow Springs Police Department between April 2010 and December 2016. This analysis will answer the question of who the Yellow Springs Police Department is citing in response to the community's concern that the department has been targeting people of color and young people. This concern was being discussed in the YS News back in 2005 
and it's being discussed in both Wise News and the New York Times in 2017. But through all this time, no analysis of the data has been attempted. This analysis will include basic descriptive statistics of who the department has cited, and will compare the race and age of the suspects in the data um, who are Yellow Springs residents to the race and age of Yellow Springs residents as estimated by the US Census Bureau. The analysis will look for raw disparities present in the data. Sonia Starr, a law professor at the University of Chicago, defines raw disparities this way. Quote, raw disparity statistics entail simple comparisons across racial groups of the per capita rates of police interactions, or similarly, I think that this part makes more sense, um, comparisons of a group's population share to its share of police interactions. Such statistics have played an important role in debates about race and policing. For example, one study recently found, in quote, blacks were subject to 63% of pedestrian stops, even though they made up just 24% of Boston's population, out quote, out quote. Um, this analysis of raw disparities will not seek to determine why these disparities exist, and it does not aim to prove that the department is, gauge, that the department is engaged in any inappropriate behavior whatsoever. For example, with regards to the potential discovery that young people are cited more frequently than older people, the fact that young people may commit more crimes or may commit crimes more frequently than older people is a factor that should be taken into consideration. Regardless, the analysis will be valuable. It will answer the question of which demographic groups the department is citing at which rates. And as Sonia Starr says, if this analysis finds significant disparities, this analysis will, quote, provide an essential starting point for any further empirical assessment of why those disparities exist and for a policy assessment about what can be done about them. Mike Bottomley will be looking at all subjects in the data and separately at Yellow Springs residents specifically. In addition to the analysis of race analysis and age group analysis, um, Mr. Bottomley will also crunch the numbers for race by sex and race by age, although the census data is so weak in the case of race by age that there will be no baseline for comparison. So I hope that more or less and, to, well. and just to say that Pat DeWeese um, wrote the MOU uh, draft. She knows how to do that sort of thing, <laughs> just to make, keep, make it easy for us. Uh, so yeah, we're basically, the task force is asking for the, you said $250, it looks like, for. I, um, think, that, I think Pat thought that I was going to add another research oh. question in there, and so it was padding it, but it's actually 224. Oh, 224. And his name is Mike? Mike Bottomley. Okay. John. Not John. It says here, John. Or is it Mike? It is Mike. Oh, it is Mike. And, uh, <laughs> John, can you, who is Mike Bottomley? So I know you said he's from Wright State. Is he a grad student? Is he a professor? Yeah, so he's a professor and he works in um, Wright State's Statistical Consulting Center. Mm -hmm. So actually, it could be that we're paying the Statistical Consulting Center. I'm sorry, I'm not super clear on that point. Okay. Can, can you talk about this, this end, the last paragraph where it talks about confidential information? And I guess I'd like to hear from Chief how, what, how Chief, are you aware of this? I've actually already anonymized all of the data. Um, so I've sent him a new, uh, so when I sent him the data set, I'd already anonymized all of these subjects' names and, and such. Uh, I did not originally anonymize the officer names, but I guess. I already sent it. But then I sent him another one with the officer names anonymized also. Okay. It was just to protect. So, I mean, did you hear? How much of this have you heard? I just walked in. Okay. So it's a statistical analysis of um, citations of disparities or in, in citations for African Americans, whites. It's, it's age-based. It's sex-based or gender-based. Um, and John, I mean, it's it's not for any pejorative um, discipline. I mean, it, it's not to do you know to to make any accusatory statements. Explain why you all want to do this, to Chief. Okay. So, um, so yeah. So just a, a raw analysis of the disparities would sort of show like which groups are bearing the burden of police interaction, but that doesn't mean that the police are doing anything wrong. Uh, like, for example, with young people, it's sort of kind of accepted that young people commit crimes at a higher rate than older people, um, but that doesn't mean that it's not useful to know at what rate a particular age group, um, say, t 
like 25, 20, uh, 19 to 24 year olds or 25 to 34 year olds are, are being cited relative to other, other age groups. It doesn't mean that the police are doing anything inappropriate by citing younger people at a higher rate. It just would tell us what the difference is. Um, and of course, this has been a concern that's been voiced frequently, so um, that the police are targeting certain groups. So just getting a, a, a baseline understanding of, of what those disparities are um, seems like something that we should be doing. Not that $224 is a, a huge amount, but I, I just wonder if we could identify a staff person who could do this. I mean, we have a Liz sitting right here next to us. Um, and I, I mean, okay. I, I don't, uh, I'm not saying we shouldn't go outside. I'm just wondering if it's something that we could do for you that since you've anonymized everything anyway, it may be, I think okay. we'd like to look at, to see exactly what you want. What do you think? What do you think? Is that a issue? Yeah. Um, so are you? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, so, what are your qualifications? <laughs> <laughs> I'm good with numbers. <laughs> uh, like, can could you make like a like? Um, I think he was going to make like a confidence interval for. Like, the true, if we could statistical analysis. Yeah. I mean, I could look at it and see I mean, what you guys are after. Although it sounds like there is a particular formula. Has he done this before? Has this guy, is this, is this, this guy is his a job. statistician he, so, so or this has is he a guy done who, this yeah, kind of? Yeah, this is a statistician <laughs> who um, not only does this him, himself, but also supervises graduate students who are, um, going, who are doing this same work and are going to graduate with degrees. In, yeah, he's got in a master's work. in mathematics and statistics and yeah, he is a statistical pro programmer analyst at Wright State. And is, does he have any specific, can, and can I guess- Can I make a suggestion? Yeah. If, uh, my suggestion is, you know, that, uh, you know, John, speak to the chief and also speak to Melissa. If it seems like it's good for her to do it, great. If, if not, it, and if all's well, and I don't think chief's gonna have a problem with the I'm sorry we didn't, run it by you, but um, it, but uh, that we just uh, agree that either he does it or we do it internally and leave it at that. I know Pat feels it's really important that we have a baseline as we're making changes and, uh, um, and that that's just a standard thing to do so that you kind of know where what your issues are. The, the rest of the committee, I guess I personally didn't have this strong a concern, so I didn't put it in my thing, but Pat and um, Bill Randolph felt strongly that it was important for the analysis for the analysis to be done by someone who was a disinterested third party. I I, I would agree. I, I would say for for two hundred and twenty four dollars, yeah, let's just Melissa's yeah. busy. Let's just it, yeah, and yeah. it sounds like this is not just this is more statistical. There has mm -hmm. he done specifically things related to police departments or or this kind of evaluation uh, I, I can't answer that but this matter. is like very straightforward okay. <laughs> analysis yeah. it's not it's actually like you can do a lot more deeper stuff with statistics but we're not like doing that <laughs> and, and you are so so we'll get a report back and you are guaranteeing and, and even if if somehow something has slipped by I would like to say that we wouldn't want a public report to contain names Right. Is I I yes. discount yes. yes. Yeah. Not citizens, not police officers. Right. Correct. Right. Okay. I so somebody want to make a motion? Judith? I move that we uh, pay for this uh, statistical analysis by Mike Bottomley. Second. For the justice task force. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And I will sign that if I uh, could have Chris review it first. Sure. Please. Well, like it, it needs a little editing. It's and like I was going to say, I'm, right. I'm guessing he design. might have something. <laughs> yeah. I, this is more just the work order. This is the, rather than. Do you right. have an actual contract, or has he sent you a contract of any kind? No. I, 
well, I, I know Pat wrote it and she said it's just kind of a standard way they do it. Um, but I'm sure Wright State has some has some process okay. that you need to go through. Right, so, yeah, I mean, like, and I met him. If I assume that I could, like, if he did anything on tour, I could work my way through the Wright State bureaucracy since he was meeting with me as a employee of the Statistical Consulting Center. <laughs> I'm sure it won't be an issue. <laughs> and John, when you put this together, will you also just uh, put it put together a paragraph that describes the data, just sort of you know how many years and what you looked at and that kind of thing? Yes. Yeah. It's and to be clear, it's the misdemeanor and minor mis minor misdemeanor data. I mean citations and uh, and warnings. Although I'm asking him to look at the citation part separately from the right. whole thing together because the warnings are incomplete um, from April 2010 to December 2016. Okay. So that's April 1st, 2010 to December 31st, 2016. Okay. Great. Okay. Thanks, John. Thanks. Uh, housing needs assessment. Um, oh, you know, I oh, was, excuse me. Oh, no, sorry. Are we? Okay. Housing needs assessment, Marianne. Yeah. Well, I have submitted a written explanation of uh, both some suggested housing goals, which I just made up. <laughs> Karen looked at and added. We discussed it. Huh? I, I, we discussed it. Did and we? I thought it, yeah, at our last meeting, I thought it was a good reflection. Not housing goals. We haven't discussed that. Well, at any rate, I thought that given that we're going to do a housing needs assessment, uh, hopefully we are, that it makes sense that we actually have goals for housing. Um, and so I've listed what we've done so far. I've listed what could be in a housing needs analysis. And I'm <coughs> wanting council discussion. But first, I would like to list what, I, what ha I've written in terms of goal, what Karen and I have uh, agreed upon. So um, the goals to inform our discussion about housing needs assessment, one, to ensure that community members have adequate, safe, and affordable housing, two, to spread the burden of taxes and utilities to provide greater affordability, and three, who has three bullet points, to endeavor to meet the housing needs of existing and future village residents with a focus on one, family housing to encourage an increased and sustained critical mass of public school, school students. Two, workforce housing for people who work here, so, so that people who work here can also live here. And three, senior and accessible housing for those wishing to downsize and improve functionality. So there, there's a limit to what village government, especially in a community the size of Yellow Springs, can do in regard to housing. Um, a lot of what we can do is set up conditions to encourage housing. And um, we've done that with the changes we've made in our zoning. Uh, we've also worked with Home Inc. Uh, and more early, uh, provided land for Green Met for affordable housing. And at this point, we're looking at uh, housing development on the glass farm. And uh, before we do that, we uh, would like to do a needs assessment that would look both, that would inform uh, what kind of housing would be best for the glass farm, but also to look at housing in general for Yellow Springs. We still do have a fair amount of undeveloped land in some substantial parcels as well as infill opportunities. So I'd like to just turn it over to council. You can see the list of things that might, well, first of all, to see whether anyone has any uh, other comments regarding what we would have as goals for housing in our community. Uh, also, the list of things that we might want to get out of a housing needs assessment. Um, one thing, um, and I don't know if I'm, you know, fully taking in, you know, the report enough to know if it addresses this, but um, the kinds of, uh, of housing, um, 
apartment building housing, for example. There's been, I, I, there's a new book out about, um, about ho housing policy of, of the federal government that, um, you know, pushed, you know, encouraged, uh, I think, I don't know, it started way back in the early 20th century, um, that was encouraging single people moving towards single family homes versus apartment buildings and that sort of thing. And it talks about in this book the, the, the way that it encouraged uh, really segregation, uh, that, you know, it was part of, a, of an effort um, to, to, to move the white working class to the, you know, to the suburbs and et cetera. So I, I don't know, you know, one thing we've, we've never seemed, to, the community has seemed not very friendly towards is the notion of apartment buildings, larger apartment buildings. You know, we have a couple, I mean, they're not huge, but if you know what I'm, you know, but we, but when we start to think about, um, it seems like a, something to me that we should be considering. Is that covered in this? Yes. In terms of, okay. I mean, not, not necessarily large apartment buildings, but to look at what our needs are in terms of rental and home ownership. What they are currently and what they, what we might project them to be. Okay. And I think, I mean, another thing related to the apartment building, it has to do with zoning. So, you know, Denise could provide some information on zoning, where it might be allowed, which zones it would be allowed in, and then also, literally the parcels that would be available to ha you know in in those districts i'm not sure that apartments are allowed in r1 i think maybe just in rc just in c as i or three r3 is it three or c because because i just um the residents is it rb or is it r2 res the RB. middle level there's rb rb yeah, the fact that, you know, apartment buildings are not allowed in RB, I mean, is something, for example, that I think we should be thinking, reconsidering. And, um, and I don't know how this kind of gets at that question. Um, but in terms of energy efficiency, in terms of density, um, you know, you get a lot, you know, you can get a lot more housing accomplished in an apartment building. And it has positives. Uh, yeah, I think that that, well. that means that's us. Okay. Looking at our zone. Yeah, but is there zoning. something about? Okay. And, and I think what what Marianne's saying is that what comes out of this when we figure out what our needs are, then that will help inform how you know how critical it is that we do um, whether it is critical that we redo the zoning code or that we look at the zoning code and consider expanding the opportunities for apartment you know and maybe it's not just large apartment maybe it's you know smaller units or cluster units or something like that but yeah Marion's right I mean that's really about us finding knowing the needs and how to and being open to that right. yeah. but I, I think it's the sixth bullet point that talks about housing needs and covers rental home ownership market rate affordable mm -hmm. so I think as long as we're just thinking mm -hmm. broadly about all those fits that would be good um, I think it looks excellent and I mean I really do think these goals reflected some things because we did talk about affordability and making sure that, that was reflected so I really like the goals in particular so um, I think it covers it pretty comprehensively good and then we do have a, a, a meeting, a, a session set up with some key stakeholders like the schools and some local employers and senior center, friends care center to discuss, to, to, to hear from them to see what their, you know, what their needs and their thoughts might be, Antioch College, and, and to talk about how we can make this a more collaborative project. And that's the first June of first June. Here, so, I'll send out another email. Okay, I so, figured it wasn't an emergency since so, the meeting. So we can have an updated report and yeah. maybe a proposal. Mm -hmm. So is part of having, forward. sorry, is part of having Antioch College engaged also to find out what their They've got a lot are? of information. 
to find out what their plans are and they actually bring a lot I think they right. bring they've done a lot of this research right. so it's to hopefully share and I do believe Sandy Wiggins is scheduled to come to that meeting oh, good. Good. okay thanks Marianne yep. yeah, thank you I was going to suggest in terms of new business since Dan's been patiently sitting here if he could go yeah the, we'll go the ahead first do that because I don't two energy board reps <laughs> yeah and um, so there's two uh, recommendations and there's also a report that Bob Brecka put together and maybe Dan can explain very briefly what it tells us uh, that was included in the packet. So Bob went through and did some analysis back to uh, 2006 of the energy usage of the, uh, the village and the uh, what we've done as far as uh, CO2 emissions and uh, curbing CO2 emissions and um, you can see let's see on I guess there is no page number but the uh, the first small chart there it's talking about the total village consumption you can see that that our consumption dropped through 2008 and then sort of leveled off uh, from 2008 on and then has, has risen a little bit since then and maybe due to uh, additional industry in, in the village. Um, residential was sort of up and down uh, depending on the year energy usage but because of the way we're sourcing our energy uh, through much more renewable sources for an electric grid and this is only electric analysis because that's the only data that Bob had available our total CO2 emission is on a nice curve down. That's that final yeah. uh, chart you can see. Uh, 2016, we're substantially lower than any other year and projected to be substantially lower than that for the future when the uh, solar array comes online. So that's really good news all around. Mm -hmm. One of the problems with, with Bob's analysis is that he doesn't have any information on gas usage in the village. And that goes back to something that we've had problems with since I've been involved in, in um, energy efficiency back uh, you know, however many years ago it was when Bob and I ran the net zero home um, project is that because of the way gas companies and Vectrin are, are set up they don't allow individuals or even uh, things like University of Dayton uh, institutions to access even anonymized uh, energy data for the gas they just won't give it out um, but by law they do have to give it out to other gas and electric companies and thus comes to our first recommendation so we uh, the energy board uh, for the last year we sort of had on our mandate to look for uh, somebody to replace efficiency smart uh, as a efficiency provider or incentivizer in the village and specifically focused on residential energy efficiency because that seemed to be the area where efficiency smart was sort of lacking they did a, a number of projects in the commercial sector but they didn't do besides handing out some little rebates and, and light bulbs they didn't do a whole lot for the residential sector so we looked around and found a company uh, called empower gas and electric and the key part of that is gas and electric they're actually set up to be an energy provider though they don't provide energy and because of that because they're, they went through all the, there's all kinds of regulations you have to go through to do that but because they went through that they can get all the gas data from Vectrum and we can give them the electrical data uh, from the village so with that combination they're able to do something that University of Dayton couldn't do that uh, net zero home couldn't do that no one has been able to do it uh, at least for local our local area is to be able to do an online energy audit of a building so essentially getting that data allows them and the weather data you enter square footage and the type of home and answer a couple of other questions they can actually online tell whether or not your house needs basic energy improvement things like insulation air sealing things like that actually mathematically you can generate a mathematical model of the house so this company uh, in power gas and Ele electric is uh, set up out of Columbus they've done <coughs> projects for Cincinnati for Athens uh, just starting a project for Dayton 
for offering energy efficiency services. So what they do is they, they have this online evaluator where they uh, get people to try to, um, or try to get people to go and visit that page, do a, a soft um, energy audit, as it were, where you're just going and entering the data. They take the historical data and look at the historical weather data, see what number of heating and cooling days there are, and see whether or not a particular property needs energy improvements. Then they offer the option of, uh, for those properties that do need energy improvements, for the, the person to, to enter their contact information and have somebody call and talk to them. They call and talk to them and then set up an energy audit where they actually come in and do a blower door test. They look through the house. This is all at no cost to the person. And then uh, they offer packages of uh, improvements that are certified. They have a group of people that do the installation and each of their uh, installers has to be certified and then they do random audits of the end result. Um, these are all things that we, as the Energy Board, we had, we had them back twice and asked a bunch of different questions. These are all really good ways of doing this and actually having a quality result. Um, so the, the points there that I listed, um, I, I talked about the, because Empower is a gas and electric company, um, even though they don't sell either, uh, they have access to the data. There's no cost to the village for this service. The way Empower makes their money is there's a percentage added on to the actual cost of the services. So they're, they're part of that. Um, Empower uses certified contractors and does random post install audits. Um, and then uh, Empower provides the advertising to get people to try to sign up for this. Um, so one other thing they, that I forgot to put on this that, that Pat reminded me that I forgot to include is they also offer financing. So the idea is that they predict a particular energy savings off the energy bill. They try to finance the improvements at that amount uh, per month so it doesn't cost any more for the homeowner uh, or landlord to actually do this, assuming the landlord's paying, paying the utilities. Um, than it would normally cost them for the utilities. And then once the loan is paid off, any savings beyond that is, you know, for the, for the consumer. So does that mean they determine how long it's going to take you to pay off the loan? Well, they, the yeah, I mean, there are parameters. They, they want, you know, the payback within a certain number of years and that kind of thing. But what the, the idea, at least the way it was presented to us, is that they try to size the monthly payments on what their predicted energy savings is. Yeah. And granted, there is this back and forth. So if you, you save uh, $100 a month and you go out and buy some really uh, energy inefficient thing and it suddenly increases your energy bill dramatically, there, there is a problem there that you have to work through. And there's, right. uh, but the idea is to try to make it so it's not, doesn't cost people any more money. And one of the things they wanted to explore, and it's down towards the bottom here, is an option of people being able to put this on their energy bill. And that's something that, that they need to explore with Patty and, and Melissa. Um, and we're talking about if, if we do, uh, uh, if the council does think that it's a good idea to uh, enter in with a, an agreement or, or a, a partnership with Empower that, uh, that they want to explore because right. they'd like to make this a, a easy thing for people to do versus if it's a loan process it actually you have to you know you have to fill out a loan as it were you'd have to you'd have to have credit it's through um, you'd have to be able to, to prove you can pay it back and, <laughs> Dan can you and can you just explain the their cost offsetting so does this essentially mean that Another service would charge you for this evaluation. No, the, so the just, evaluation is free. No, I know, but I'm yeah. saying is is that what this offset means? So like well, they, it, they shift the cost of that evaluation they shift the cost to of, the service of, price. Of that the, the evaluation, the, the setting up the whole system. I mean, they have to have some money to stay in business. Okay, so the the revenue comes from somewhere. The the revenue for Efficiency Smart came from us. Right. You know, we, we paid $43,000 a year or whatever it was for Efficiency Smart, and that's where the revenue. This revenue is shifted over towards the consumer as far as keeping them in business. 
Um, and what we recommended as, as the Energy Board is to try to offset some of that and to encourage people to, to uh, step up and do this is that we offer some rebates. Mm -hmm. And we came up with a set of rebates, uh, discussing it back and forth with, with village staff, uh, that from, um, uh, that we would base this on size of the structure, having the improvements, so we'd offer, um, let's see, uh, $250 for structures of 1,000 square feet or less, 1,000, 2,000, $375, and 2,000 above $500. And if we set aside $10,000, we could have up to, to you know, um, 10 to 20 structures uh, done in this first go round. We can see, evaluate it, see how it works. How, and, how long will they stick with it? So let's just say they do, they do 10, initial sure. and nobody signs up how long are they going to stick with us I, I don't know I mean that's that's always the problem with this sort of thing is they, they have a list of different things that they try to do I mean the, the the nice thing about this versus efficiency smart is actually efficiency smart the the the, the incentive was for them not to do anything this the incentive is actually on the the company I mean, they're not, they're not going to get any business unless they do outreach, unless they get people to sign up, right? So it's, it's on them to try to do it. They, their programs in, in Athens and Cincinnati sounded like they were very successful. Have you, has, I mean, I, w I would like Patty to talk to those municipalities. I would also like to hear from end users who have actually used them. I'm, I'm not at all comfortable with the idea of the village financing improvements to somebody's house so I mean I'd like to look at these things in a step fashion you know I I like a lot of what I see here all of the stuff rolled into the whole package I'm not comfortable with every piece of it um, are there other companies that do this I mean do we have a choice of vendor there, there isn't that I know of there are no other companies that do this overall thing and this is essentially the holy grail that Bob and I were trying to shoot for. Right. So that's why this was. was oh, it's so, it's. I mean, it sounds it, as it, you've it explained it. Yeah. And, and and the the there are lots of little companies that do energy audits and do the actual work. Yeah. But normally, like like we had to do when we were doing net zero home, we had to charge six hundred dollars just to cover our costs on the energy audit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because they have this online tool that separates out the people that actually need this service from the people who don't they would they the people don't waste their money on having somebody come in and do a, a full energy audit when there, there isn't any savings without spending a lot of money mm -hmm. uh, essentially empower is going to be in targeting the the houses that really need the basic things uh, what they target is insulation air sealing duct sealing uh, smart thermostats and LED lighting and that's essentially their those are the big and those are the big bangs for the buck I mean they're mm -hmm. they're the top top five so if you don't have those problems it's a lot more money to do energy efficiency and I think it was a three to five year load yeah, that's three that's to five year it. loan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and about. and if you let's say that the monthly payments would be over five years, if you want to speed up your payback, then you can choose to pay back at a faster rate and have it go away after three years. I mean, I think or you that, can just pay for it. Or you can just pay for it. Yeah, right. And, and and the idea with the the um, the rebates, it's no different than what we did with. Uh, Efficiency smart. It, they, I mean, they gave the same sort, right. sort of rebates, not not for insulation, but for the smart thermostats right. and the LED lighting and all that. And I, you know, I I like the rebates. I mean, I've been wanting us to do something like that. It's sure. the, the financing is is a, a whole nother step that sure. that is concerning. I mean, and I guess I just like to understand that. But we're not. Financing. That's what I'm reading. That we're, we're not financing no. anything. The, the it just goes through our bill, or that the, 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 they want to discuss the uh, uh, 
possibility of that. We wouldn't be financing it. It right. would just be built through. And, and honestly, I have concerns about that, that yeah. we need to work yeah, out I, before that's even. Well, I saw yeah, the minutes you guys talk about trying to, if you could segment it out, right? Right, because that And, and, and the, this be was a discussion. Our, this wasn't a, a yeah. I, I wanted to make sure to put it on here because they're, they're very interested in it because it is sort of the future of how to deal with this, right? You, you have the savings and then you have the cost of the energy improvements. And the, and the, the reason that this works, I mean, the reason they're trying to, to push this is a little bit more of a, um, to try to get the rental properties as part of this. This gives the incentive for the landlord to agree to the, the energy efficiency updates because it follows the tenant's bill. So if, it, it, so if you, the, the idea is, and this is only if they, they can get this full system set up, is that if it followed the electric bill for one particular address, that particular tenant would benefit from the savings, but also make the payments. And it would incentivize the landlord to do energy efficiency. We have, we have this real problem is how do you incentivize a landlord that doesn't pay the utilities to do energy efficiency updates? And, and this is a way, granted not, the, not a perfect way, but a way around that that we wanted to investigate and discuss and see whether or not we can come up with a solution that would work. Um, again, it was it was set up so that, or the way we discussed it with them was that they work, they talk with village staff to see whether or not this was even feasible or mm -hmm. not. I mean, something I'd be interested in is is maybe having them work with the credit union um, on on financing. And I'd also like to understand how the contractors work. I'm assuming they pick local contractors. So again, you know, it's it's tough with contractors to know the quality and to and to they, make sure the, the, the contractors in their system have to be certified that to meet particular standards and have particular training to be part of their thing and then they mm -hmm. have the, they have a scoring system based right. on the results that are randomly done. I mean I, I'm I'm happy. What I'd like to do is direct Patty to do some due diligence on researching the company, researching the communities. Especially Athens. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, if we could, I saw in the minutes there was discussion about that language, you know, that related to landlords and renters. Sure. Um, I'd love to see some of that and just understand more about how that incentivizing works. Well, again, this what we're trying to do is work towards trying to incentivize landlords uh -huh. and and this what we came up with is that at least for an initial set that, that it was too difficult to come up with a way of doing that without the discussion of putting it on the bill and that sort of thing uh -huh. that if we could start the program see what the responses are from from the um the community see whether anybody signs up for it if nobody signs up for it you know, it's probably dead in the water. If these people don't actually commit to advertising enough, I mean, they talk about a bunch of different things that they do. They do community outreach, they do, uh, you know, presentations and, and mailings and all this other stuff. If they don't follow through on that, it doesn't cost the village anything. And, you know, it, nothing happens. If, if ever, you know, if 20 people sign up and they all want the full package and we spend the $10,000, then that's great. We've now, improve 20 homes and there, if there's a waiting list of 20 more we can come back and see whether or not we want to spend more money on more rebates but it was a way to sort of get our foot in the in the door and see how well these people work and then offer you know recommendations a year from now to say well this this has done a great job we should expand the program or well they didn't do it such a great job maybe we should go look for somebody else one thing that I um, had raised at the Energy Board meeting was uh, how, how do we try to focus this towards people of lower income who, in terms of the rebates I'm talking about now, Johnny brought up the idea of approaching Greenman Housing, um, you know, because they, and, and that would be, you know, government to government, maybe communication to see if there was an interest there versus just, you know, making the rebates available to just anybody who, the first come, first serve kind of an idea. Um, and I personally would like us to think about that before we decide on the rebates as to how we can try to focus it towards where there's the greater need. And particularly if like, if Green Med Housing, for example, would be 
at all interested. Um, and I mentioned this to Marianne, and she was saying um, that Susan, I'm not going to be a serial last name. Yeah, Styles. Susan Stiles, who's on our um, planning commission, um, you know, she used to be the director there, and she might be able to help us uh, mm -hmm. know whether it's worth per pursuing, and if it is worth pursuing, who to contact, and that kind of thing. I mean, I do know there was a huge problem at Green Met, and they, they, I think they totally put new heating units, new Did they? HVAC units in, in, in there. All of, in all of the Green Met it, Well, uh, at or least just, everything just on, on Quarry, on quarry yeah. the Quarry yeah. Yeah. Right, but depending complex. on how much insulation they put in and how much weather sealing they did, right. they may be able to save way more right. money. Well, yeah. I know that there are several properties, Green Met properties, that are all electric, and it kills people in the winter. The yeah. bills yeah. are... And yeah. all, an all electric house, that's yeah. But this wouldn't address that in, in more than just in reducing the amount of electric use, but that's the top. Yeah. So let's, I mean, I think directing Energy Board to keep working, work with Patty on, on you know, we can bring it doing back. the due diligence. Sure. We can bring it back June 5th okay. for an update. Okay. Yeah, yeah thank very you. Good. Yes. Tesla's. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, he's not done that. <laughs> Tesla's. Right. Okay, so uh, we have two electric car charging stations, but one of them is broken. Um, Johnny's working on getting repair parts for that one. Um, Tesla is introducing their Model 3 car, which is the uh, much more affordable $35,000 starting price, um, <laughs> well, with a $7,500 tax, tax credit on that. So it gets down reasonably, uh, at least comparable to a, a Honda Accord or something, 100% uh, electric cars. And in as part of that, they're trying to increase the number of charging stations and the network in the United States. So they have, they have a, two different types of charging, charging stations, one called superchargers, which uh, are very high current, high speed charging uh, stations, and then what are called destination chargers. Superchargers are set up along highways, destination chargers are set up in places people come to and congregate. So hotels, restaurants, uh, community centers, places like that. And because they're trying to encourage people to install uh, uh, destination chargers, uh, they give them, well, they've always given them away for free, but they're also, uh, they give the charger, they give the pedestal, and they also supply $1,500 for each charger to install it. So essentially it's free, if it breaks, they replace it, um, plus they, they give us $1,500. Uh, we have to cover the, the cost of electricity. Um, the, the other thing that it, they do is they put the, the charging station on the onboard navigation system for the Teslas, so it actually draws people to town. So people mm -hmm. who come to town, plug in their car, have to spend two, three hours going and be sitting in their car, or you know going to the restaurants, shopping, that kind of thing. Uh, while they're they're here, um, in discussing this with, with village staff, they actually recommended that with the usage that maybe we expand the number of slots for electric car charging to three, having the center slot be a combination of both standard car charging and Tesla, one of the side slots be just Tesla, and the other side slot be uh, uh, a standard car charging using, using the second one, so we could have a opportunity for either or in the center, Tesla on the left, and whoever plugs in on the right, um, as an example. And so. you've talked to Johnny, Johnny's? Um, actually, yes, um, Johnny is is in favor of this. Um, he has actually talked to Jason about potentially moving uh, the handicap spot over closer to the building, the one that's out there next to the chargers, mm -hmm. and moving that over closer to the building. and and taking that third spot to be a, a an electric car charger with a Tesla. And he talked about pedestals. Will Johnny still, will, will he, would he just expand the unit, the wooden unit that's there, or he'll, would he'll, they be ex he'll installed have, differently? He'd have to pour, it'll be a similar installation, but he'd have to pour some more concrete to get it out there, which is where the, the stipend will come in. I mean, his okay. crew can do the work, but there will be materials involved in, okay. in expanding it. And, and, and essentially all Tesla needs is an agreement that you want to do this and an and a, uh, electrical drawing like you would have to submit to the, the zoning, uh, okay. electrical zoning board. And they said within two weeks they'll have them here. And, and Tesla's okay, okay with uh, one of those spots being a shared? Yeah, that spot. No, as long as it's, it's there in public, they don't have any problem with that. Okay. As a side note, the chargers we currently have are supposed to be 
on the web, right, for people to find? They are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, and why don't we just give four versus three? Well, what, I mean, we, is it what we thought, Jerry, is it's my understanding that um, that ramp is going to come out because remember we redid the sidewalk and the ramp was going to come out and if the ramp comes out then we can expand the other way and actually add a, a couple okay. of parking spaces if we need to. So um, if we do that, then that would be potential to to make them the all separate, separate charges. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I have a question, but more generic about the chargers. Is the purpose of the chargers to be available for people who are visiting Yellow Springs That's as the opposed intention. to residents? That is the intention, yes. Because I, have, I don't support having residents bring their cars and get free electricity when they could be doing it there. Well, house. and that's why there are two signs up now, one that says four hour maximum and the other one that says no overnight. I mean, is parking. there any reason why a resident should need to use the charger? I mean, maybe there they is. They drive into town and, I mean, I wouldn't want to restrict it, but I think it was being abused. I think there's a difference between, I, I don't I don't know how badly it was being abused. It was, bad. mm -hmm. it was pretty bad. Okay. <laughs> there were two there were two residents who would park their cars there overnight consistently every single night. <laughs> when, didn't bad. that burn out the one? That is what burned out the one. Yeah. That's bad. Um, <laughs> so, so that's the caveat that I, I mean. Yeah. Oh. I'm, I think it's great, but then I think we need what a signage or whatever. But when Dan drives his Tesla into town, he needs some place to plug I, in. I, I have my own solar panels. <laughs> well, he needs to eat lunch, too. Yeah, he needs oh, to eat lunch. lunch. All right, well, I, I'd, I'd, like to make a, yeah, I'll, I'd like to make a motion to support the Tesla chargers being installed as proposed. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. And Thanks, can Dan. I ask again, um, we were going to, at some point, like, you know, put a parking, uh, you know, charge, you know, for the electricity versus the community providing that. And I know it, what it costs more to do that than to... It costs $20 per unit per month to put a swipe your credit card thing on them. So it would cost you $40 a month for them to just sit there um, and people to swipe their credit cards on them. And is there a way, is there a simpler way? Um, I mean, the reason I, the reason I ask is I have heard from citizens who, who kind of feel like, uh, you know, they don't want to be subsidizing that. And I don't well, know. Well, and, and I do understand that. I yeah. do understand that. But if they're not abused like they were being, I mean, we were only paying 11 to $20 a month total for both two, of the chargers. For the two chargers. Uh -huh. So the, the cost to have the right. card swipes on them would be more than what we were paying. Well, perhaps for the if and when we start paying close to right. what it would cost to have the card swipe, we should And do. I wonder if we could just put out a donation. If, if, if Melissa, could you maybe find a, a oh, yeah. secure mm -hmm. donation box mm -hmm. to put on there? One yeah. of, one of the, the restrictions of Tesla is that it has to be free. How? But, but if we put a donation box, we'll... I, I, we can ask. I don't know if that's considered a oh, I probably, think, probably I think Alon will probably a, be fine with that. <laughs> why, don't you, why don't you check that out? I'll, I'll, I'll ask, but yeah. We'll just put it next to the, the standard yeah. one. Yeah, put it next to the standard <laughs> one and <laughs> point Thanks. the other ones. <laughs> Thanks, thank Dan. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, we've got two uh, reports from Patty on um, things that uh, were discussed at uh, previous meetings. Um, um, there was the one thing about the summit, which I had listed under new business. Remember at the beginning about getting together with the school board and the... Oh, okay. Budget. And I, not, we don't need to talk about it long, but given that there are major projects by all three agencies, it seems like a good idea for us to be meeting. Really, I think we should do it on a semi-regular basis. I agree. And it, one focus of that is not just how we coordinate those things, but the impact that all of these things are having on affordability, I think, is a crucial concern. 
Well, and I wanted to say too, after reading the paper and re understanding that, um, you know, the Mills Lawn uh, area could end up being a K through 12, and the impacts that could have on the whole community, you know, the whole downtown really, um, when you think about all that activity happening there. Um, and I know the last discussion, it sounds like from the paper, the last discussion uh, around you know, the idea of, of building a new school building there that would be K through 12, um, it really kind of shocked me to think of the impact that could have on the whole community and the fact that, you know, the village, the village council that, you know, attends to the streets and just all the activity down, in, you know, all down there, it just, I just felt like we need to have, I would really like to have um, a conversation with the school board. I mean, they've talked, so, so Mario and their architect have reached out to Patty and they've, mm -hmm. and staff, and they've had one meeting. Brian and I are both on the facility committee, so we've been attending meetings. I guess I feel like I don't want to be, I don't want to be, this is, this is their bus that they need to be driving. I mean, I, I agree with you that, that it's clearly a, a big community conversation, but I don't think we can force the conversation. They're still exploring, I think, that, that, that some of their findings have caused them to maybe step back a little bit I, and, and maybe reassess some of, some of the options. I'm getting the impression that maybe they're going to slow down a little bit. Um, but I don't, I don't want to be, I yeah, don't it's, think it's, it's, I don't think, I think I agree with you. I think we need to have a joint meeting and I'm sure that will be a discussion, but um, <coughs> they've got a lot of their own research and, and, and work to do that um, I think before they're really ready to come forward with a firm proposal. Well, one thing I, I you know, that did come up at the meeting we were at was uh, not recognizing what our intentions were with the glass farm and just kind of thinking about housing. So I do want to make sure that, you know, we're having those kind of conversations. You know, yeah, which is also one of the reasons we want somebody from the schools to come to this stakeholder meeting so that we really have an understanding about what capacities the schools are working towards. Um, so and that and that you know we're kind of in sync with that. I mean, we don't need new schools built only to find out they're not big enough. So, so in terms of getting the three bodies together, do oh, I mean what I'm thinking is uh, is maybe we can take the lead of writing a letter to the other two bodies. Um, I can either just write it and send it, or I can bring it to the next meeting, and and maybe throw out some dates. I mean, kind of look at the calendar. Um, I know, I mean, the trustees already meet on the first, you know, that we, we meet the same days, so um, that w might make it a little bit easier if they're in a position to be able to kind of give up one of their meetings. I'm comfortable with you writing a letter. Okay. I, and I guess I'd like, yeah, if you could bring it to the council. Would, you know, okay. As we're thinking about how to communicate around I mean, because I am I know you get you have some specific ideas of you know what what exactly you're looking for and I may not articulate that um, but yeah I mean I'm definitely in support of it Judy maybe um, I don't know what you can do maybe maybe just pull together some dates at least preliminarily um, well I can certainly figure out when their regular meetings are right when they're what, what's right. ruled out basically right although I'm trying to remember the last time maybe you could look at the last time we actually did have a joint meeting that was a long time ago. It was in 2015. Yeah, two years ago. It was in 2015 because John Young was still here. That, that should be pretty, pretty readily done. Okay. Uh, to figure out with Miami Township trustees. Cool. And then just. Um, okay, so um, next we'll talk about the uh, proposed smoking ban for village property. Um, okay, earlier this year, uh, Shana's reporter came um, from the uh, Combined Health District and she presented a sample ordinance for Council's consideration to prohibit smoking and the use of tobacco products in parks and grounds within the village. Council asked me to look into who potentially had these bans, what the bans included. Um, 
I did look around some of the um, other um, municipalities that have them in this area are Oakwood, Marysville, Athens, Columbus, Overland, and Champaign County Parks. So there's just a few. There are numerous bands. They run the gamut. Some of them allow vape, vapor cigarettes. Others uh, do not allow vapor cigarettes. Um, some of them prohibit it entirely. Others allow it in specific areas. Um, but not in others. The fines uh, run the gamut from $10 for a first offense to $200 for a first offense. So the only thing I can tell you with any certainty is a lot of people are doing it. Um, there are a couple of other handouts in the packet that Shernaz um, provided me with. Components of a successful policy. Um, and that tells you how to go through the development of your own policy and what you want it to include and um, why you should do a tobacco-free policy for outdoor recreational facilities. So I, I want to make a suggestion because we have these two proposals and it's uh, getting toward 9.30. We've been meeting for uh, three and a half hours almost that we have a brief discussion of each of them. Yeah, I wasn't make going to decisions about right. It. No, no, I was yeah. I was just going to suggest I I support it. I think maybe I would like to ask Patty to just put a proposal together. Um, I, you know, I, I I get I do get concerned about about staff. I mean, I don't want to totally restrict s staff because I know they already can't smoke in their vehicles. I'm assuming they can't smoke in their vehicles, can they? If not if they drive a vehicle for work. Okay. Correct. So I want to make sure we're being sensitive yeah. to our staff who are smokers, but I think generally I would support this ban. I, I feel like, um, uh, well, a couple things. You know, we're talking about um, our police department, um, you know, uh, sort of prior. Well, we're thinking about what's the priorities of enforcement. And, you know, some kinds of smoking, we want to be a low priority of enforcement, right? So, well, I don't know if we do or not, but that's, some people feel that way, certainly. So, so um, if the point is to, um, if the point isn't to just make life hard for people who smoke, but it's really about, uh, it's really about, you know, the effect of, on other people's health, um, then having a, a restricted area where people can go um, to, to have their smoke and then go back and play with their kids or whatever. Um, I mean, I would be for something less restrict, something like that. I'm not for us um, punishing people for having an addiction to tobacco and at the same time, other people who don't want to have to have secondhand smoke around them should also be protected. I support that also, uh, having a restricted place. And I think as important as that is having places for people to put their cigarette butts. Yes. Yes. That's yes. a bigger problem, I think, maybe than the smoke, secondhand, Any outdoor other? smoke. Well, I just, I mean, when I read the literature, um, you know, the, the restricted place, if it's visible, creates the issue of bad modeling for children, which they focus on a lot. And so I worry about that with the Bryan Center. So I guess I would support that restricted place if it was hidden away. I don't know. Well, I, I, I don't disagree with you, but keep in mind that there truly is no hidden place here because even this back piece of the building here, kids run through it all the time. Oh, so okay. So, so we're just sort of putting out our but just, ideas. Yeah. yeah. So just put together some ideas. Okay. Um, do you want do you want fines for this? Do you want this I, to be a that's, I, To me, that's a detail. We'll talk about that. Just put together yeah. put okay. together what you think. Put together your recommendations, and then we'll okay. Um, and then the tree city. I mean, this all sounds great. I don't know that we really even need to talk that much about it. I mean, it sounds like yeah, kind of a no-brainer. I mean, I can complete the application online. Well. I, I am concerned it's extra bureaucracy and unneeded. Hmm. Hey, you know, Arianne, I understand where you're coming from, but it actually is a really good program, and there's a lot of cooperation amongst the amongst the members of the tree city I mean community. it's not something I'm going to fight about it's just that's my reaction that we have enough people here that 
are into trees and we have a tree committee and I don't think we need it. But as I said, I'm not, I'm it done. Sounds like I'm done. The well, there was, I think this came out of uh, my suggestion at yeah. the energy board that we, uh, as an energy uh, reduction, you know, that we have more shade trees and that we, and, and I call, and I did talk to the tree committee uh, briefly and they were interested but it was too late in the season mm -hmm. so if you know if the village uh, wants to pursue that and then you know put a little money towards trees for next spring that they would help us coordinate that and maybe through the schools get shade trees out to the kids that they can yeah I mean, know I, how I, to plant and uh, yeah I, I did make Annabella sorry aware that this was um, yeah coming Good. that's why and, I and she about. was it, she was supportive of yeah. it yeah I mean she I is in favor of it so yeah. I think showing our commitment is is important um, and uh, I, I don't feel like the that there are, I feel like there's a lot of people in the community that uh, I mean I think there's something about recognizing the uh, old trees and the importance of shade that really you know I, I don't know I think there's something I think this could be helpful in that effort and regarding Arbor Day, Mills Lawn celebrates that every year, so I think that's where yeah. I would suggest that's where the uh, yeah, and, and that's where that's how we did it in Williamsburg. We had a speaker, we handed out a tree seedling to every kid, yeah. and uh, yeah. it was always and I, very successful. I think we can do more. Yeah, cool. Okay. I disagree with Mary. And so, <laughs> so you want me to submit the next? You want me to submit an application? That's the next yes. step. Yes, I'm for it. Go ahead. Okay, <clears throat> okay. Um, last um, on um, new item of business is that um, on Friday I actually received two inquiries um, from uh, for business opportunity for uh, medical cannabis uh, production, cultivation and production facility. Um, the one was much more developed and much more serious. Um, and we've been, um, we had a conference call today. We received a, a, an extensive presentation. We had a conference call today with our solicitor, Patty Bates, Melissa, um, Denise Swinger from Zoning, myself, and Brian Hausch, and um, two folks from the company called Cresco. And they have uh, developed three facilities in Illinois who have had where there has been medical cannabis for longer than a lot longer than here um, quite successful um, and they they just put together a pretty impressive presentation it's turning around incredibly quickly because the state of Ohio just released the, the way they're doing their their the regulation is they're re, Re re releasing it a piece at a time. So they're releasing cultivation standards, then they're releasing production standards, then they're going to release uh, dispensary standards. So this particular organization is just interested in cultivation and production. It is in a facility. There's no open growing in the field of marijuana. <laughs> it's, it's all in a facility. It's all very controlled. It's all very secure. And um, uh, it, it, it looks like an opportunity um, that, w that I feel like it's an opportunity that the village should explore. Um, council did discuss it. It was an item we discussed in executive session since it is about real estate. We're looking at um, potential parcel at the Center for Business and Education. There's one that works, we understand. We, we checked about the proximity of churches and educational facilities and a piece of it seems to work. So um, staff has been asked to kind of move forward to do the exploratory work that needs to be done. So um, we're excited. I mean, they're talking about 65 jobs. They're talking about a $5 million facility, um, high paying jobs, 65 jobs at around $40,000 a year obviously a, a wide variety among that but uh, entry-level positions positions that would would be very easily and well filled by our citizens so it's really just the kind of opportunity that we've been thinking and hoping um, for I wish the state I wish it wasn't coming so quickly and requiring so much quick action um, one thing that's going to be very important is that um, there is 
strong support from the community and I think that they had done their research to recognize that Yellow Springs had already expressed some interest and that we certainly hadn't passed one of the moratoria that other communities had so um, you know so we're part of what we're doing is announcing it now to start to get the community thinking about it and um, staff will be working on the logistics and we'll be following up with these folks and certainly it will be a, a large public discussion the schools following up the schools all of the uh, political subdivisions county um, schools township um, anybody impacted the businesses in the re in in that area um, so it's just a lot to think about but it's a it's an opportunity we think is uh, deserves exploration and I wanted to mention a uh, major utility user as well. So um, we've done all the reports. Now we're on to board and commission reports. Um, Jerry? Um, <clears throat> other than, than what Denise uh, uh, presented in, in her reports of things that, that she, would, she was doing, um, we uh, <clears throat> tabled a, a couple items and uh, one had to do with a uh, a request that we received for uh, adding another housing on uh, Dayton Street that uh, we asked for a little bit of additional information that wasn't in the packet uh, and we uh, as uh, was mentioned in, in the, the uh, zoning report, uh, some noise issues with some uh, factories, uh, industries. Uh, so we're waiting to hear more from Denise on, on that. Uh, but at the, the time, we felt that that was something that staff should look at. We saw there was a planning issue, we would, we would take it up. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, Brian? Uh, yeah, the Arts and Culture Commission is recruiting members, and also uh, I heard the kindness banners are going to go back up after Street Fair. I believe that is correct. All right. And um, we'll be announcing another uh, Village Inspiration and Design Award winner soon. Um, for uh, the Economic Sustainability Commission, uh, I have a little bit more of an update because we spent the meeting talking about the second community conversation for the CBE. And um, the if we are ready to do it sooner rather than later, um, the commission feels that that could happen at the end of June. Um, we need to have one more meeting to finish planning, but just roughly, the idea of topics to cover um, was, first of all, uh, beginning with a report out on the survey that was done related to the first conversation, highlighting the key issues, um, and then everything else pretty much being focused on the covenants. Um, that seemed to be the source of misunderstanding or lack of education that we probably need to address. So first of all, um, where the covenants come from, uh, secondly, the legal implications, and in particular, how it's not easy to change those covenants, so they are uh, a great protection. Um, and then something related to uh, what uh, Denise talked about at a prior meeting about where we're at and where we're going in terms of housing and, and that sort of thing. She talked a lot about the issue of infill. Um, and then something we're hoping that Melissa can help with is uh, some financial implications. And so Melissa, we were kind of thinking about maybe uh, a little bit of scenario analysis, you know, just what would happen if we had a new business like a medical marijuana facility? What would that do in terms of income tax and property tax and the effect on um, rates for utilities and so forth? And then Marianne, it was remembered uh, that you were talking about background of, you know, the businesses that we had here which I think could be in that third section about sort of, you know, where we were, where we're at, where we're going kind of piece. Um, so I guess I wanted to get a sense for, does that sound like a good plan? Should we move forward? Should we try to pick a date? 
Sounds good. So June 28th was proposed as, as a possibility. I don't know how that looks for folks. I think that's a Wednesday, maybe? Mm -hmm. It's open for me. Uh, I won't be here. Okay. I'm going to be gone most of that week, I think. We could pick another date, too. I guess the one thing we were thinking about is get moving into July or August. It's probably going to be more difficult. Um, our meeting is the first Wednesday of June, so it could really happen probably any time after that. 28th would work for me. I, I, I'll have to go to leave a little early. But. Okay. So, Marianne, do you want to, do you want to move it up? Uh, earlier? I, I mean, June is just not a good month for me. I'm going to be gone a lot. In June. Mm. Okay. The second half of June, I'm going to be gone much of the time. Okay. July um, would be better, but I mean, if I'm the only one, that's okay. Okay. Well, it'll be video, so. Um, I'm fine with it. Okay. So, June 28th, 7 p.m.? Yeah. All right. And actually, I guess I'm recommending rooms A and B. Um, sort of okay. like a work session, but we can discuss that further. No, that sounds good. Okay. Uh, Judith? Uh, well, the Energy Board, you've heard pretty much uh, <laughs> what has been being worked on from Dan. Um, the Justice System Task Force, uh, we're, we're working particularly on kind of a process question, question of how to bring proposals forward within uh, this, this idea of notice and comments, you know, and we had a, a very good discussion on all of that. And uh, we're starting to look at the mayor's court, the issue of the prosecutor. Um, Chris is coming to our July meeting, Chris Connard. He wasn't able to come to the June meeting that I had hoped he could. And we'll probably be hearing from uh, Jennifer Berman, beginning to think about restorative justice and how that might inter interface with the mayor's court. Okay. Marianne? Um, I haven't met with the mediation program recently, nor I, I think I had met with Steve Kahn before the last, I mean, I did meet with Steve Kahn, but I forget. I think I already port, reported on that meeting. Uh, the HRC, two topics that we talked about at the last meeting were creating a welcoming package in particular for people in green met housing so that they would know where to go for different things, maybe having some things like the newspaper coupons for businesses, um, and also uh, seeing if we could get the bikes that the police department get to be passed out to the school kids, especially the eighth grade kids that go on that bike trip down the bike path. And uh, then, the Environmental Commission, we went over our goals. The only thing that we talked about that wasn't in the report was the idea of using a risk assessment as the basis for developing our goals. So in other words, looking at what are the environmental risks in Yellow Springs, and then are there particular things that might come out of looking at that to uh, inform what our goals are for the Environmental Commission. I like that. Um, I was on, a, regarding HRC, um, I met with um, Kevin Magruder and, and um, I'm going blank on her name now. Um, anyway, primarily Kevin, who's working on a diversity brochure. So they're working on a brochure that would be geared towards residents um, or potential residents that would focus on all the opportunities regard around diversity and encourage diversity and be used something that would be out in public and with realtors and um, so I suggested um, I mean the chamber is going to work on it um, and support it as we can but I suggested they might also want to talk to HRC yeah. that that would probably be a, a project that HRC would be very interested in so who is doing this Kevin just, ju but Magruder. just uh, on his own. Um, he's. I, I think with this, it's a three. I guess it's three sixty-five. I guess. Uh, yeah, right. It's. Yeah. It is three sixty-five. Oh, that's that's neat. Well, that's cool. Yeah. Oh, really and by you know. I, I did forget to mention, I had uh, sent away for these two brochures that are on our desk uh, about invasive plants. 
So these are things that we can have hard copies of, but we can also um, put them on our website and um, um, print out copies too, as far as that goes. Great. Cool. Uh, Green County, County Regional Planning Commission, um, there really isn't much of anything to report. Uh, I, there are a couple things I did pass along to Patty. One has to do with, and this is something that actually will impact um, whatever development happens at, at Glass Farm, that the post office is no longer in new developments allowing individual house mailboxes. It all has to be gang mailboxes in, in new developments, new housing developments. So, for, so if, let's just say if, if where Patty lives hadn't, was being built now, they would have to have gang hmm. mailboxes. So, you know, not that big of a deal. And then they're also working on census. They're getting prepared for tw the 2020 census. Um, Green, Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission, honestly, I mean, there isn't much. I mean, we've got our, we're on there for, for our safe routes to school, so that's good. Um, we just got off of the uh, Miami Valley Cycling Summit and the International Trail Symposium, so they were very involved in both of those as far as the bike trail system is concerned. Not much else coming out of Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission. Can you mention that Complete Streets Workshop, just that they're going to do that? Oh, and well, Brian is, has coordinated with Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission um, and the alternative um, or the Active Transportation Committee to do a uh, uh, complete streets workshop here in Yellow Springs. And it's, we're, it's in the planning stages and it would be an open meeting for anybody to attend. Yeah, they do this for free. Um, when do you think it would happen? Um, they, the first thing they would like to do is kind of a, um, a figure out sort of a planning of what the workshop should be to customize it to Yellow Springs. And they're recommending end of May or beginning of June to do that. Um, and so, and then from there, we can set a schedule. Would you let me know when that? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> I'll, say, I'll include you, I'll send you the dates and we can make okay. a date. Well, and what we'll do is just, it will, we'll make it a council meeting. I, I'm yep. guessing that maybe more, more than two council okay. members, so what, we can just make it a special council meeting or something mm -hmm. or something. Okay. Um, I, just, I just wanted to say on the thing that Kevin McCrude is working on, I know Anshini Nomoto said that Sam Eckin Road had told her about kind of the history of the village, that that was part of what it convinced her to move to the village, you know, the years mm -hmm. back when she moved here. And so I think that intersection with, uh, you know, with the real estate people mm -hmm. and, and rentals and housing. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. That's yeah. yeah. Um, then with the chamber, again, um, everybody is invited um, to the uh, business after hours at DMS Inc. this Thursday at 530. Um, there will be tours um, uh, of the facility, which is really fabulous, and obviously food and beverage. And I think there may have a keg or two from Yellow Springs Brewery. So. Um, and um, I don't know if everybody, if anybody has noticed the uh, bike fix-it station over at the train station, but the yeah. chamber um, purchased and the village installed a nice yellow bike fix-it fix station. So, oh, what is um, there? Yeah, what is that? What can you fix? You pump? you put your bike. And there's a big pump on it, and you and there's a rack oh. to hold your bike, and there's tools. There's this whole little collection of wires, like secure. Oh. Um, tools on and so I mean people <laughs> use it all the time it's really neat I mean it's, it's actually most of the most of the uh, um, train stations or most of the of the stations have them now wow. Xenia has two or three of them oh. and um, we also have the sign on the building the uh, Buckeye Trail sign that we are now a Buckeye Trail town so that's really exciting and that was a great ceremony um, yeah. that we had a couple weeks ago and the year of the trail resolution is going to be hanging downstairs. We get to right. keep it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, future agenda items. Um, one thing I, I wrote down here, Judy, we've got to remember to put times on here. Put agenda times. Just. Um, 
let's see. So tomorrow night, we've, it's just us for the chief, chief interviews, May 30th public interviews. Um, the one thing I did add to the June 5th was that HRC will be back to do their report. Mm -hmm. Um, second reading, anything else? Yeah, you need, are you, do you want the summer sewer ordinance to come? Oh, yes, uh-huh. And that's an ordinance. Will that be an emergency? It probably needs to be yeah, if you want to have should. it happen. Um, and then did you want to bring that proposed letter? To yeah. Um, okay. And then Patty, I, I don't know if you wanted Patty to have an update at that meeting for the Energy Board recommendation regarding Empower, or? Or do you want it under my report? What? Um, Empower, the Empower program. Yeah, just put it in your report. Um, let's see, well that's, yeah, the, the summer sewer race is already on there. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, and are we, do we need adopting guidelines for policing? Do we, yes. we're, are we there for that? Yep. No, I'll, will we be? For the, yeah, we will for June 5th. I thought we just decided that we weren't going to be, Marianne just presented about. Well, it doesn't mean that we can't make decisions on specific issues, that's, is that what you're saying? Are you talking about yeah. the, the document that came from 365 right. subcommittee? Well, yeah, yeah that you were going to. But you guys were also going. We'll have two weeks. You guys were also going to edit it. We've done that. Well, that's been done. But we were going to meet with 365, and I don't know if we can do that between. Okay. I don't so, know when they meet. So we'll check in. So we'll. Let's just Possibly. say. Let's just put that on June 19th, and just because we've got an awful lot on the fifth already. <laughs> So we'll just put it on the 19th, um, and then we hopefully we'll have a resolution appointing a permanent chief. So I think that sounds like a full agenda. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 I don't know.